We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And it's a special episode, uh, just because... It's a landmark episode in terms of where the numbers have ticked up. I'm going to do a fancy little transition and woo, there we go, number 800, yay! Tom has no idea what I'm talking about. He's not seeing no the video and I just switched. But if you're watching on YouTube, our lower third banner changed to a very celebratory number 800 episode of AV Rant. So welcome everybody to the 800th episode of AV Rant Podcast. Yes, mm-hmm. 800th episode and I'm sick. Ah, <laughs> Well, welcome back from vacation. Yeah, uh, which... my stupid son. It's coughed the whole way up there and the whole way back. We tested him for COVID like 32 times yes, or whatever, yes, yes, and yes, he yes. was fine. But he had a cold, and he gave it to me, mm-hmm. and I've been miserable. I, it's not a regular cold. It's a man cold. You wouldn't understand, mm. Rob. It's very. It's a dad man cold. Ah, it's a yes, difference. Yes. Well, at least our little uh, graphic of uh, fireworks is blending into your beard right now, so that uh, that all works out. That all looks fantastic. <laughs> great <laughs> but i do want to say a thank you to lee overstreet who guest co guest co-hosted with me last week during episode number 799 so a thank you to him while tom was away and welcome back tom and hope you feel better soon there i think that's me all too. the things i'm on the mend but okay. i'm just it's been yep. far too many days of this nonsense i'm been injured from ah, yes. climbing and i haven't been climbing or uh cycling in two weeks and did have a good time on my vacation, went to New good. Orleans to see family and ah, do okay. stuff. Yeah, so, I didn't actually know where you went, so there that's it is. That's where I went. Nolens. I went to New Orleans. Nolens. No one says it like that. Only people in movies say Nolens. <laughs> I mean, I, I almost know no one. Maybe somebody in Shalmet might say it that way, but I don't think so. So it's either New Orleans uh, New Orleans for people who don't live mm. there and New Orleans for people who do. Okay. Uh, yeah, so good times. That I think the kids were a little bored because it's really an adult town okay it's not really meant for you know there's no there's no things for kids to mm. do i mean there are but we didn't do any of them because <laughs> that's not why we were there so we hung out with my family and uh I have a bunch of cousins aunts and uncles that live there so we saw everybody I went to uh lsu uh, louisiana state university which is my dad's alma mater mm-hmm. to go take a tour there for my sophomore son to see how he liked it and the tour was if anybody here works at lsu anybody listening works at lsu y'all need to work on your tours okay the people who ran that tour <laughs> specifically the person who gave the opening speech beforehand was atrocious. Oh. I mean, actively offensive to me as a human <laughs> being, to be honest with you, was really... Dis- My wife and I, this is how bad it was. We were in the middle of the speech texting each other about how ah, bad it was. Okay, yes. I mean, it was bad. Mm. Um, I've been on like seven or eight different college tours now, and LSU was by far the worst. <laughs> by a mile it was the worst and my dad was so upset he was oh, like so dear. which one did you so is anybody gonna go to lsu my 12 year old son is like, i'm going i'm like he's the only one that didn't know what the heck was going on the rest of us were like what is this person saying it is <laughs> it was the worst like it's a college tour and and the 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 opening speech basically mocks science as being silly uh, and not important like and i'm not talking like well, politically i'm just saying like like, I don't know, they do something over there in those science buildings uh, that I don't understand. And that's and they're all a bunch of nerds. I'm like, ugh. <laughs> yeah, it is right. a university. It tends <laughs> you might... to be academically inclined people who seek out to go to a university. So, you know. <laughs> it was so bad. Anyways, <laughs> so then I came back with a cold and I've been mm. complaining and whining ever since. I see. Uh, and we're babysitting a dog. Mm-hmm. So I've got this 77 pound dog running around the house, <laughs> uh, knocking things over with his big old tail. Cause I'm used to this itty bitty dog. So I had to put them both in their crates cause they were playing right before this. I'm like, we can't, y'all can't come in here. <laughs> there's no room. 
for the two of you to get goofy in here. So <laughs> they're in the other room whining, probably. I actually have the door open. I can hear them. Okay. Not. But uh, yes. So this is AV Rant, the podcast that is mostly me complaining about things. Could be. That's why it's rant in the title. <laughs> that's, what, that's why we call it AV Rant. It's not AV. Let's, let's all hug and kiss. Definitely not. Uh, my throat hurts, so I might take oh, some breaks no. to get more more coffee, and I mm-hmm. might be sucking on a cough drop at yep. some point. But I have been COVID tested, and I am still negative. My wife's there like, are... every once in a while, she just looks at me and goes, definitely, go take a test. Definitely other, other viruses out in the world that still exist. Yes. How dare they? Mm-hmm. Don't they know we're in the midst of a pandemic? They're not... That's that's not cool. They're like, you don't hey, show up at somebody else's party and start drinking. That's not the way that works. The new hotness virus came around, but don't forget about me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Remember me, the common cold? That's hey, right. we call you common for a reason, yep. buddy. Yep. Yeah, basic. You gotta go. Sorry. I thought, I thought we killed you off in 2020 when nobody went outside uh, for a year. <laughs> didn't happen. Didn't happen. All right. Uh, podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to avrant.com, look at our listen to and read the notes from our previous podcast. 800 episodes of them mm-hmm. at this point. Whoop, whoop. Uh, let's see. Uh, Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast. YouTube.com slash AV Rant. Uh, you can contact us directly, Rob at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is, his Twitter is at, at firstreflect.com. My, uh, I'm Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is at AV Rant underscore Tom. I literally, in the middle of that spiel, thought to myself, hey, I came back from vacation. I'm not messing it up. Uh, Immediately messed it up. That's how the brain works. That's <laughs> immediately forgot your twitter handle i'm like i've only been saying it for a bajillion times should be muscle memory by now but nope got the yips i i still can't remember the the offline rant line oh no no phone number unless i say the whole spiel i have to like i have to remember the spiel to get me up there and then it will just pop out of my mouth it's funny (laughs) All right, uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week. Mm-hmm. Become a listener of the week. You can support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrent.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and leave us a PayPal donation. So we want to thank Nick for doing that this week. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, Nick, thank you for the PayPal donation. We appreciate the financial support. Speaking of financial support. That's right. We also have our 145 patrons yeah. over at patreon.com. This is an important number because mm-hmm. we will be using it in just a moment. We shall. Patreon's a service where you sign up to become a uh, ongoing, sustaining member of our podcast community. Every month, they'll take a little bit of money from you, however much you say, and give most of it to us. So I guess it doesn't have to be a little bit of money. It could be a lot of money. Could be. We don't, we don't expect that. <laughs> I will say that uh, when I was going through the Patreon, uh, the Patreon today, there's people leaving us messages, to which I say, oh. thank you very much. But if you want anybody to read them, you should send them to us directly. <laughs> Because I did not literally the, the first time I've gone in there since the last time we did a contest <laughs> was today. I, I leave never all go the to the Patreon. financial side of things to Tom, so I, I didn't notice any of that. Apologies, but it <laughs> no. is patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. If you would like mm. to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation, you don't have to like stop being a patron after episode 800. So, you know, that's hey, right. You can join and continue I, on patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. That's right. And a big thank you to our 145 patrons over there. That's right. If you can't support us financially, we completely understand. Just uh, let us know what you have done to support us. Or if we happen to know this, we will mention you anyways. So we want to thank Ash, who's created our uh, episode 800 artwork. He says it's not totally complete yet, but it looks pretty good to me. Uh, it looks like he needs to put an AV at the top of the 800 uh, That rant. first one. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, it looks great. I'll be so using I, it anyway because really, it's, really it's a big it. old 800 and uh, that'll catch the eye. So it's getting used regardless because that's what I've got. <laughs> okay, it looks great, Ash. Thank you very it much, does. Ash. Of course, is longtime supporter and listen. I think listener. I don't know of the podcast. He's a very busy boy mm-hmm. uh, or person. I really don't know. Ash, Ash, is that a general neutral name? I think it might well, be. Anyway, I, it doesn't matter. Ash is a great <laughs> individual, and I thank you very much for your uh, your contribution to this podcast because these yes. look great, and uh, it's always nice to have something to show off uh, a milestone like the 800th mm-hmm. episode. So thank you very much. Yes, a big thank you to Ash. I really do appreciate the uh, pro bono work being done on that. That's definitely a donation of time and effort to the podcast. So love it. Yes. We also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going during our ongoing pandemic and impending 
world war i don't know what's happening anymore so <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna soldier through as if tomorrow Blinders will come on. <laughs> we are we're talking about av here yep. people no politics i'm sorry I, this is two hours where we're not worried about the rest of the world and that's not me being insensitive or saying that we shouldn't worry about it i'm saying that you got to give yourself a break every once in a mm -hmm. while this is your two hour break from worrying about that crap for right now just relax and think about home theater. So we got some notes of gratitude from Mark from Grinder, who says after Rob's dust up on Twitter, he found him the perfect mug, which is says I'm silently correcting your grammar, which is not true. It's the wrong mug for him because Rob has never been silent about it. He corrects it out loud uh -huh. immediately. I mean, I suppose like, on Twitter, it is technically silent in that it came in the form of text. <laughs> It's, it's not silence in the sense of not mentioning it because it was mentioned causing the dust up on Twitter. All Who those, did you dust up with? It's all the superfluous S's. It's daylight saving time, not daylight savings time. It's oh, I say it that in way. In regard yeah. to, not in regards to. So you don't, you don't need the extras. It's also an invitation, not an invite. Any, anyways, instead of anyway. That's right. <laughs> that's the one that that's the one that uh, that Grammarly always corrects me on when I type <laughs> it. It just the S comes right after. Mm -hmm. It's like the I N G. Like if I type an I N, there's coming a G mm -hmm. after whether or not I want to type it or not. I will say though, on the way I put an S on like because you can you can say you go toward something or towards something, and those are both correct. So I know uh, yeah, I put I know. the S on the end of that one. So who am you I may to think they're both correct, and they may be both correct, but there are definitely people out there who do not agree that I they know. are both correct, because I have been corrected on those. Oh, <laughs> uh, we got a thank you from Jeremy from Ash, who says, keep up the good work. Andrew and Nathan, who says, thank you for all we do for this community. Congrats on 800. Yeah. So that is going back over them again. Mark, Grinder, Jeremy, Ash, Andrew, and Nathan. Boy, I should have brought Kleenex in here. Ah, well, I will say the names one more time. Mark, Grinder, Jeremy, Ash, Andrew, and Nathan. Thank you all very much for the notes of gratitude the notes of encouragement are definitely appreciated a big big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions and yes congrats to ourselves on 800 i'm quite proud of reaching that milestone all right uh so we've got our giveaway let's go ahead and do it at the front of the podcast so that people who are stressed about it can find out okay you should not timestamp it though you should oh, make all right yeah, that's fair enough is. You should make wonder how far they're gonna to have to listen to this thing. Okay, they, they'll skip to the end. They'll skip. They're like, oh, where is it? Who knows? Uh, it's in the same place it always is. Yeah, right yeah. after we do the, right after the listen of the week, the listen the of giveaway. the week will still be time stamped. So yeah, that's true. So we got our giveaway from James House of Cards. He's mm -hmm. giving away his open box U Mike One and SPL meter. Uh, I think we talked about shipping with him, and he says we'll ship it pretty much he'll anywhere, ship right? it directly yeah from him yeah, we're not going to so, ship it twice so we are going to email the winner uh -huh. based on the email that you put in patreon that's so right <laughs> if, if that's a, if that's a fake email then you is out of luck <laughs> very and I, I think we'll yeah. pick like two winners i think okay. so that we have a backup oh. just in case well let's just well, announce I mean, the name here we'll and then announce... we'll have one in reserve yes, privately. you and i will have one okay. in reserve finally so maybe i'll even pick we'll even pick three afterwards or something okay so we'll have some backups in case somebody so if you signed up for patreon and you used an email address that you don't often check now it's the time to check it because uh, yeah. we are going to send you an email that's mm -hmm. going to say you won you're going to it's going to ask you for your uh mailing address mm -hmm. and all that information and probably phone number as well because you if usually you need it, to put it on there yeah these yeah days. so yeah. this is not us trying to you know dox you or whatever <laughs> it is uh we're just going to send that on to james uh directly and then james will send it directly to you because yeah. alternative is james sends it to me and i send it to you which means you're going to be waiting a long time to get it because I don't go to the post office. I'm sorry. And it's that's, two I'm, people paying for shipping when it really yeah, isn't necessary. So. It's totally not necessary. And James, is a, believe me, he's got no time in his day to be to be uh, stealing your identity. So, uh, Rob, we have 145 patrons okay. over here. I have downloaded them from patreon.com. Right. I've just downloaded the entire list. It looks to me like it has come in in order that people have signed up. So if you're the Which longest time fair. patron, you're going to be. It, so it's no, it's not alphabetical or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. It's just whatever. That's the that's well, the actually, way. Actually, it that doesn't really done. matter what number either of them are because it's a random number being selected. So. so I've got. It says here a hundred. Oh yeah, one hundred forty-six. Oh, well, let me take off this first line. So it's one hundred and forty-five. Okay. Uh, I have put uh, into the random neat. number generator between one and one forty-five, not from zero, uh, okay. from one to one forty-five. Okay. And 
generate. Okay, but 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 generate, and we have reached one twenty eight. One twenty eight. I'm going to bring that over here. Do so we remember the the email of the person who was the the one? No, because this is definitely not them. Because okay. the last time we did this, somebody won twice in a row. That's right. I very know. strange. <laughs> this is this uh, user's name is Robert. Ah, okay. Last initial initial is W. Okay. W. okay. I won't say your full name. I wonder if that's podcast. our Rob W who did the printed panel thing, because that was a Rob uh, W. Could be, <laughs> but uh, if, if he doesn't want it, then uh, so let, let me just. Uh, how am I going to do this? Because I want, I want to, I want to have it all done at the same time. Because if not, we're going to forget. Okay. So nope, that's not it. Where is? So I'll just, I'm just going to give you three random numbers. We have no idea who that lines up yeah, to. Hold on a second. <laughs> why? Why are we doing that? <laughs> we're doing it right now, Rob. It's, it's getting done. It's, it's getting done. <laughs> what great podcasting this is. It, so it, this prepared. is great pocket. So Robert W. Yes. And uh, is the first that winner. That was 128. And then, yeah. uh, let me see. I can't understand why this is so hard to figure it out. All right, forget about it. We'll do the rest of it later. <laughs> That's fine. So I don't, want, I don't feel like dealing with this anymore. And write down three numbers? I was going to do it, but now I'm not doing that anymore because it's too... It, 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 I, have to sc- I have to scroll between too many screens. And it keeps losing. What is going I on I can here? write it's down three screen. numbers. Do you want me to just generate you? Just generate three numbers. <laughs> write them down. Oh just go God. ahead. Oh, that brought that right up over your face. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Second number generated was 95. The okay. Third number generated was two. All right, so that's an early supporter there. It's probably Tom. And no, so. that's a uh, yeah, that's the most recent supporter there. Ninety five was the next 95, one. Ninety five, two, and fifty six. There we go. Those were the. Where oh my goodness! All right, well, I gotta that's... compose myself. I don't want to say the names of the people. No, who, we won't say any names. We, we said Robert W. That's that's the official name. That's drawing. the winner. And that's a that's the only we have an email doesn't address for him. I don't know why we had to do that on the podcast, but anyway, there it is. We're doing it. It's our fancy. It's, well, yeah, it's done now. I'm not it's editing done. it. Anymore. What was the third number? Fifty six. Fifty six. All right, go ahead. You We're, continue. Continue it. podcasting, Rob. We're done. All right, I'm gonna go on to the news because that was just because I'm doing this. This is that happening. That is a very AV rant giveaway draw. That is that exactly is, the way it should be. Professional, this Rob. Podcast. This is this is professional. 800 episodes of podcasting, uh, right. professionally done. It's been done and email sent. It just shows you how often. We <laughs> So is that, is that going to come from your Tom and Avi rant email address? I don't know. I just yeah, picked exactly. an email. Yeah, it, it, it's going it to come picked, from some picked, email address the guy doesn't even recognize. No, I'm sending it to you so that to we, we have the we yeah, just so that we have a record of it, oh, and then geez. I will send uh, and then I will I will send an email to him later. Don't okay. worry, the Tom and Avi rant stuff will come later. Don't worry. Okay, or maybe I'll say that from the Avi gadgets. One. Congrats, Who knows? Robert W. for being the worst randomly drawn name. In the history it was a perfectly drama. fine randomly drama yeah, name. It was, was all right. the the pomp and circumstance afterwards. Right. We should have like, I I should have no no I have a pom pom. Yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> thank you James House of Cards for doing this thank for you. us and uh, to all of our patrons, 145 patrons. Please stick around. We do appreciate your patronage. It does make a big difference mm-hmm. in us uh, paying our the little bit of overhead we have and also giving us uh, the ability to occasionally upgrade or swap out <laughs> equipment when things break, which they do. Uh, so thank you very much to all of you out yes. there. You know, I know uh, Patreon is a, as a, as is as little as a dollar and that doesn't feel like very much, but believe me with a, with 145 of you, that makes a difference. So thank you very much. Yes, indeed. In the news, Epson finally, uh, not, uh, uh, officially, and finally, launched their home cinema LS eleven thousand. Mm. I hate that number. It's too big. It's, it's what too, it is. Why are there so many zeros? There's just nah, too many zeros. <laughs> this is the the LS twelve hundred from overseas, right? The four K laser projector. It's now here in North America. The price is four grand. The product pages indicate some differences between the four thousand dollar home cinema LS four eleven thousand and the five thousand pro cinema ls twelve thousand besides just the obvious case and color uh oh obvious case color and price yeah. case color because the home case cinema color. is white and the pro cinema right. is the, black the 1200 the 12,000 is not overseas it is the pro version and then the the 
the yeah, it's the same 11, number everywhere. Is. It's an LS eleven thousand for the home version, yeah. LS twelve thousand for the pro version. So this is so the, the pro version, version is usually black, right? Yes. Is yeah, that right? right. And the L and the the home version is going to be white. That's in it case you're for a thousand dollars difference in price. That's right. It blends into your ceiling better. <laughs> the LS. 12,000 claims slightly higher lumen output, 2700 versus 25, but it also uses an ultra black polarization filter that doesn't seem to be present in the LS11,000. This lets the 12,000 claim 2.5 million to one contrast, while the 11,000 claim is 1.2 million to one contrast. So not quite as black black. Yeah, they're pretty much saying that the black is half the nits in uh, the uh, Pro Cinema 12,000. Right. Right, Which, right. in the blackest of black theaters, could make a little bit of a difference. But so, yeah, sure. that's where the, the doubling of claimed contrast comes from. It's on the low end. So, both do 4K 120 with 240 gigabits per second HDMI 2.1 inputs. Both use native 1080p panels that are refreshed at 240 hertz using Epson's Precision Shift glass plate technology. The most PSGPT. catchy name ever. Yep, that's right. Epsgpt. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to did not <laughs> acronymize that one it is i can i can't imagine why <laughs> both have fully motorized lenses with large zoom and lens shift ranges and both mentioned using epson's new zx pr uh, picture processor to apply scene by scene grammar uh grammar <laughs> <laughs> gamma adjustments for hdr which sound very similar to sony's dynamic hdr enhancer so strictly speaking this is not frame by frame dynamic tone mapping a single tone map is applied and there's a 16 step slider to adjust the overall image level but the image can be processed to maximize detail and contrast the ls12000 also comes with a ceiling mount and a longer warranty three year versus two year which makes which begs the question why are we is anybody buying the the well i guess it's a thousand dollars difference yeah from a thousand dollars so i mean if you really want black instead of white and that's worth a thousand dollars or if you right. think the included ceiling mount and the one year extra warranty is worth a thousand dollars but mainly it would be that you really really want that ultra black polarization filter that cuts the nits in half on your black level that's that's the big feature difference um oh one other thing is that the pro cinema 12000 supports external anamorphic lenses and the uh, home cinema 11000 does not at least according to the spec sheet they, there's no mention of supporting anamorphic lenses with the home cinema 11000 but there is specifically a mention of supporting anamorphic lenses with the pro cinema 12000 so i think those are all the differences personally i would pay a thousand dollars less get the 11000 and if i want to use a portion of that 11000 or of, of that one thousand dollar cost savings to make a black hush box now i can make the ex, uh, externals black and even quieter that way all right i like it mm -hmm. Because you know. $4,000 for 4K 120 on a projector, that's the lowest price we've seen for that. So I like it. Okay. <clears throat> and I apologize. I will be coughing slightly. Mm -hmm. I am, like I said, I'm on the mint, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm like at 75%, okay. maybe 80%, depending on when you ask me, but I am. I'm still a little bit under the weather. Odyssey released their ACMIX measurement mic. Acme? It's a Is one, that actually. To be? It's ACM1X measurement mic. It looks like Acme. Acme X. Mm. That's what it is. I'm, that's what I'm calling it. <laughs> Acme X measurement mic for $80 for use with Odyssey Multi QX on PCs. Is it, it's, it's exactly the same mic. Hardware-wise, identical to the mic that comes packed in with any Denon or Moretz receiver, but is individually calibrated at Odyssey's lab in uh, Los Angeles and given a unique serial number, which you enter into MultiQX to download that mic's individual calibration file. Odyssey did de also did a detailed run-through of uh, MultiQX on the, with Audioholics on YouTube and mentioned that an updated version of the Odyssey Pro mic kit is in the works, which they mentioned a long time ago, with an extension cable as long as a kilometer, which they also mentioned mm -hmm. a long time ago, plus the, the necessary microphone preamp. But no price or release date were mentioned. But given the fact that this thing is 80 bucks, you tell you right there, it ain't going to be freaking cheap. <laughs> well, I mean, much. to just get a replacement microphone, the one that didn't come with a unique calibration file, that used to be 50 bucks. So they're essentially saying $30 for the individual calibration file. They did mention you do not get to download the calibration file in a format where you could use it with Save Room EQ Wizard. 
So this is not <coughs> an individually calibrated mic for use with anything other than Mult EQX. It is through the Mult EQX PC software that you get the calibration file that is unique to this microphone based on its uh, serial numbers. So uh, once again, I'm sort of feeling like everything that Odyssey is doing with Mult EQX is like close to what we want, but not <laughs> really what we want. <laughs> Um, Let me tell you right now, just in general, like yeah. my 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 kids were like, "Can we, can we buy No Way Home, this new Spider-Man sure. movie?" I'm like, "Absolutely." I, I heard, heard it's good. Yeah, you know, I'm interested in seeing it, and I wouldn't mind having the good sound and everything. Like, uh, I'm like, uh, they're like, "Okay, let's 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 buy it." It's on the Amazon. I'm like, "Okay, you mean it's on the Amazon?" They're like mm. on the Amazon Prime, you can yeah, buy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Ah. <laughs> I'm just not. I'll buy the disc. Mm -hmm. So I went and looked. The disc's not out yet. Yeah, you know, because ah, of the right, windows yeah. and stuff like that. Can you do the thing They're, where you pre-order the disc and they give you the download code ahead of time? Maybe, they used but to do I that. didn't. I don't think they. I didn't see that option on there, but I didn't. Whatever. And then I had to sit there and have a discussion with my family. I'm like, let's. At some point, Amazon's going to make a decision that they no longer support these things, and then it's going to go away. Everything about this Odyssey Multi Q X thing, mm. which I. I agree with you. I think that it's something we've been asking for. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think pro installers are really going to love. Yeah. But the fact that it is a, you know, a marketing decision away from every, somebody flipping a switch and it all <laughs> just disappearing, <laughs> that you can't just download it and just have it. I mean, mm -hmm. why would you not? I mean, I'm paying $80 for a mic mm -hmm. and the, the, the individual calibration file that goes with it it's not like I can use it with another mic. It's an individual yeah. calibration yeah. file. Why do you have to keep it? <laughs> Why can't you just give it to me? Right. And then if I sell the mic, then the other person gets the individual caliber. Mm. I mean, because all you're doing is adding an, an extra step, right? Mm -hmm. You're adding the, so then the next person has to get it and then they plug in the, the code and, the, and then you give it to them. Or maybe you charge it. Charge them again? I don't know. It's very stupid. Well, they'd get charged again for Multi-Q X itself because Multi-Q yeah. X is a one, I mean, it's it's not one time use, but it's one unit, one owner right. use. So even if you, like, even if you sell your AV receiver, the next owner can't use the same license of Multi-Q X so, that you bought. It's one owner, one receiver. So Reaper is the is the program I use to record my voice mm -hmm. while we're doing this podcast. Okay, I use uh, Audacity, no, yeah, Audacity to do the to the the final edits because okay. I'm more comfortable with it. But I record my voice with uh, Reaper because for whatever reason, Audacity has introduced historically uh, delays. I don't know if oh. it's a computer or something like that. But what would happen is every podcast. Uh, we would end up with some, we would mm. end up out of sync by two or three seconds. And mm -hmm. I would have to go through the podcast and figure out where I could tighten this up so that we were once again speaking mm -hmm. normally. Reaper doesn't do that. Okay. And it's, it's not free, but you can trial it for pretty much ever if you're willing to wait <laughs> like six to 10 seconds to get the stupid thing to open. Right. But I bought it. I bought it on my Mac and it, it gave me a license key. And then I switched to this computer, yes. which is a PC. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't remember, obviously I couldn't remember the key, it's some random mm -hmm. string of numbers. So I contacted them and said, I can't find the email that had mm -hmm. the key in it, can you send me my key? They said, well, we don't, you know, I said, well, I paid for it with this account and I paid for it with this PayPal account because I used the AV Rant PayPal account to pay for it. Thank you very much, AV Rant <laughs> listeners, for supporting us in that way. And Patreon listeners as well, because that all goes into the same PayPal account. And they're like, we can't find it. Mm -hmm. So now... I'm like, well, I'm not buying it again. Ah. <laughs> I bought it and I'm not buying it again. So this is what people are going to be working with with <laughs> Odyssey going forward. This is the, the level of idiocy that having <laughs> everything be online introduces. If for whatever reasons you lose something or they lose something, it's gone forever. And they're like, well, mm -hmm. I can't help you because we have no record of this. And that's why I really hope the whatever's going over there at Odyssey, they like they're trying so hard to keep so tight control over everything that they're gonna make the user experience so unpleasant that people <laughs> are gonna end up just being like, I'm not giving you eighty dollars for this microphone with a 
with a that's not very good with a calibration file that I can't access unless I use your stupid software, which is that I don't want to buy for a single unit for a single right yeah. for my one thing. Or when I could spend a hundred dollars over at Cross Spectrum Labs, mm. get a better mic with its individual calibration file that will be good on any computer to using any program at any time. Mm -hmm. Why would I spend including Dirac? <laughs> yeah, including Dirac. Why would I do why would I do that? Yeah. Why would I spend eighty dollars on your mic when I can spend a hundred dollars? I think I think that's what he charges, right? Over at Cross Spectrum. It's like a hundred uh, bucks. It's 100, like one ten or one twenty at the most or something, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I just or, I, I mean directly from mini DSP, because you do get a calibration file from mini DSP. It's just not right. quite as granular and you don't get as many angles as you get from right. Cross Spectrum Labs. So right. but you still so, get a calibration yeah. file from mini DSP directly. I, I don't see I, I don't see this going well for Odyssey. They're going down the wrong path. I, re I really don't. All right. Uh, more new Are we still on the news? We're still, still on the, the news. news. <laughs> 2022 uh, OLED prices have been made official. LG's 97-inch G2 will cost 25,000 euro, which means the U.S. price will likely be just north of 20 grand. Mm -hmm. Uh, given that the 88-inch 8K Z2 is priced at 30,000 euro and 25,000 USD. So, or, yeah, 25000 whatever yep lg 77 and 8 the three inch uh c2 models arrive at 35 and 5500 dollars respectively which is cheaper than the starting prices of the c1 models last year but not as cheap as the current clearance prices on the c1s mm -hmm. so you know prices are coming down most surprisingly samsung has priced their 55 and 65 inch S95B QD OLED TVs at $2,200 and $3,000 respectively. That's about $1,000 cheaper than Sony's QD OLED prices on their eight, uh, I'm sorry, A95K models. And it's exactly the same prices as LG G2. Oh my God, you're killing me. Mm -hmm. LG's G2 OLEDs for the same screen sizes. So it's pretty clear where Samsung is aiming. I just read that, and I don't know where they're aiming. Where are they aiming? Could the you same translate? prices as LG's G2 OLEDs. Okay. So LG's sort of flagship <laughs> 4K OLEDs, exactly the same price for the 55-inch and the 65-inch as Samsung's QD OLEDs. Also, they are straight up calling them OLED TVs, not QD displays, not even QD OLEDs, just OLEDs. But because it's Samsung, there's no Dolby Vision. That's so right. you. <laughs> What's my reaction to that? That's a lot of words for me to go, ugh. <laughs> Why would anybody buy a display right now that doesn't have Dolby Vision? I mean, I'm not saying that Dolby Vision is the best, but... It's just a checkbox. And Why? there's lots of content that has it, I know. For Samsung <laughs> to still so... be this obstinate about it is bizarre, but whatever. I, I, you're, you're like, my our customers don't care about, about Dolby Vision. <laughs> not yet, because it takes most customers about five years to figure out what the current technology is. And then they start asking about it on Reddit. And everybody's like, mm -hmm. what are you even talking about? Dolby Vision was so five years ago. The Apple TV app on your Android TV, Google TV, and Fire TV devices has been downgraded. You can no longer buy or rent movies or TV shows from Apple Movies directly through your Apple TV app. You can still watch any content that is in your Apple library. But you have to make purchases or rental from a different device. The reason seems to be Google's 30% commission for any in-app purchases. Some apps have used to have uh, exceptions, so the terms of agreement have probably changed. So not not going to give Google any money, says Apple, who has all the money anyway. So. And who also makes sure they charge everybody else 30% on their devices. 30% on the devices, that's right. That's our 30%. <laughs> and then someone else does the exact same thing at the exact same amount. They're like, how dare you clutch ah, my pearls? This is... <laughs> <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is unconscionable. Yep. Is that a word? I think it is. Anyways, it looks like Netflix wants to figure out the best way to make some money from users who share their password. I just think this is dumb. <laughs> Starting as a trial program in Chile, where Costa Rica and Peru, where apparently people don't know how to complain as well as they do in the United States. I don't know. You'll now get a prompt to add an extra member as a sub account. If there's a login from outside of your household, there's also a tool to transfer a profile to the new sub account so that personalized watch lists and history are retained. The new sub account adds $3 to your subscription price. I mean, honestly. Okay. <laughs> 
I feel like Netflix as well within their rights to do this. I think that this is... It's always been, been in their terms of service that you are yeah. not supposed to share your password with anyone Hulu outside of your did this household. a long time yeah. ago because I used to share an account with... My friend came... I told you guys about this during one of the hurricanes whose name I can never remember. They came over here and stayed at our house where they were out of power. We were out of town because we were waiting, making sure that we didn't come back to no power. They came and stayed in our house and he signed into his Hulu account. And then I got Hulu until after a couple of months, Hulu sent in the things that said, it doesn't look like this is the right, this is the same, you're, you're, you're viewing from two mm-hmm. different places. Is If this is the, the right place, then we're going to block the other place. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to do that to my friend. So I said, that is, you know, so I, then I got my own Hulu. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I know people are complaining about this and, right. uh, I understand their complaints, especially with people who, you know, it's like I I upgrade the account because I wanted the the better sound and mm-hmm. stuff. And I got a bunch of different, you know, streams I can have yes. that I don't use mm-hmm. or need. Shouldn't I just give those to somebody else and let them <laughs> use it? You know, my my child's about to go to mm-hmm. uh go to college and he's going to want to stream Netflix and well they're saying you yeah, you'll be able to they're just going to add an extra three dollars onto your monthly bill that's that's the way they're going to handle it now I mean yeah. on the one hand it's less than having two completely separate Netflix yeah. accounts at full price for both so there's that I'm actually a little surprised that they're not starting with the add-on even lower because my thinking is they just want to get everybody onto separate accounts and then they'll start jacking the prices up of the sub accounts. So I was like, why don't they just say, oh, each sub account is a dollar more because who's going to complain about They're going to go, oh, you know what? We've been doing this for free this whole time. I guess it kind of makes sense. I'll pay the dollar. As soon as they have that dollar and the profile switched over, then the price starts going up. I figured that's what they do. I think even $3 is is enough to make people think twice about it. So, But this is just trial. Maybe that's where they'll end up when they roll it out in north america and the rest of europe and that yeah i i don't know i i i I feel like this is okay but i i do understand why people are mad and and especially people who are you know like i said my son and and other people in similar situations where they can't really afford the full account and maybe they can't even afford it for the three extra dollars a month i mean right there's some people who are definitely in those situations and you know they've got a friend or a family member who's like yeah just you know sign in and i'll sign you in and it's no big deal yeah i i can i can understand but you know there's both sides of i also am getting a lot more cognizant of how cheap everything is these days especially media you know, mm-hmm. we went from having to buy a CD or, a, or you know, a record or, a, you know, a cassette that had a full album because you liked a song and you spent $10, 12 $15 on it to 99 cents for the one song you like and that's and you never bought never, another thing mm-hmm. again to being able to stream it for basically the the and the the artist getting nothing yeah. and uh you paying nothing at the same time <laughs> except for listening to some ads so content has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so you know to complain you know at some point you have to say somebody has to get paid we yeah. they're not just going to keep making something for nothing. I mean, they're not us, Rob. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Not going to do it for the love of doing it for however, what, 15 years now? <laughs> We've been doing, I've been doing this at least. Is that right? Yeah, no. I, close. Is, yeah. I think this year, May, is going to be 15. Is that right? Yeah. It's right. 15 years. Wow. Anyways, it's been a long time. So, <laughs> anyways, let's go on to some comments from our listeners. Tom in Prague heard Scott's question last week about uh, potentially using a large closet as both a wine closet and the AV rack closet at the same time. Tom agrees that using active refrigeration to keep the whole closet at constant 13 degrees Celsius would be ideal for the wine and great for the AV gear too, but ideally for the wine bottles, the humidity would be kept high at 70%. Tom has refrigeration humidif- and a humidifier for his wine cellar, so he's a bit concerned that relatively high humidity and AV gear might not mix so well. You guys didn't mention 
uh, humidity that has to go into the wine cellars because it's all about the corks, making sure that they don't uh, yeah, dry out. Yeah, no, uh, Lee and I didn't talk about that. Uh, yeah. So that is a good comment from Tom. I'm not actually sure if 70% is problematic for electronics. I mean, d- intuitively, it doesn't feel like it would be great, but like I was looking for operating humidity range and it just isn't mentioned the way operating temperature range is right. mentioned in spec sheets. And I don't actually, because I mean, the thing is, Living here in Vancouver, we've got high humidity all the time. You're not getting away from it. And like I live in Florida, tell me about Yeah, humidity. exactly. Yeah. And I mean, even if you have a dehumidifier, there's still humidity in the air when you just live in a place that is high humidity. So I'm not actually sure if it's actually a problem for the electron. I don't know. I don't know if seventy yeah, percent. I would probably I, I guess what I would do is I would call uh probably like emotiva. Because they'll answer, <laughs> like somebody will answer a phone over right, there. Right, 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 right. And or SVS, you know, able, to be honest, <laughs> SVS as well too. Yeah. Sure, because because they're speakers. But I mean, I would uh, because they make amps, mm-hmm. and that's the well, part. Well, SVS I would makes worry like about. their prime wireless amplifier in that too. So if there is a that's true. humidity concern, but I mean, like to me, I'm like seventy percent. Like that's lower than the ambient humidity where I live at all times. So yeah, when you think humidity, when you think that you're trying to keep a room at a constant humidity, that sounds bad. Like things are going to be moist in there. But 70% humidity is just, I mean, around here, that's low. Exactly. I mean, my humidity yeah. is So my is instinct is that 70% humidity wouldn't be a problem for electronics. I don't think it's going to, like, they're going to start sweating and stop working. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't feel like that. Well, I'll be honest with you. When, you know, we went to uh, New Orleans, which it, many people consider to be a very humid place mm-hmm. and everything else, I... And my whole family, our lips dried out and our right. noses got very, very dry because it, it's so much more humidity yeah. here than this. You're in used New to over 80% most of the time. Yeah. Uh, Ilango wanted to share what he found uh, that he found a proper summing cable for anybody who wants to play stereo sources from a single mono cable. He had been looking for a solution for quite some time since he uses uh, a single in ceiling speaker in some rooms of his house for whole house audio. There were instructions online on how to sol- uh solder your own summing cable but he didn't want to mess with that (laughs) i'm with you dude so he's happy when he found a cast line usa and their 3.5 millimeter stereo to quarter inch mono summing cable with the proper resistors already included and at a reasonable price mono price has very inexpensive rca adapters if you need them so that's what he found just a thing to keep in the back pocket there and yeah it was like 15 dollars for the cable which you know is that's a that's a decent profit margin anyway, but it's not the type of profit margins we sometimes see on specialty cables. So that's right. that's all right. I'm off. I I'm saw somebody on Reddit asking for a budget DIY subwoofer cable, and every answer was like, "There, I mean, how much cheaper can you get? Right? Than what you can buy at mono price? I yeah. mean, it's just a it's couple a, of bucks." It, 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 <laughs> Gonna, just, or Amazon Basics, also I mean, a couple it's of just, bucks. They're all fine. Yeah. All right, questions. Yolongo, ha- again. Uh, Yolongo <laughs> has two future setups where physical, physically small subwoofers are needed. He's going to have a family room setup that is open to the rest of the house. He has already set his expectations appropriately, is not looking to pressurize the entire space, or hit reference volume down to 20 hertz. <laughs> Good. Yes. Unless you like having refrigerator size subwoofers in your house. Aesthetics in this setup are a big priority and two very small subwoofers in the two front corners are as good as it's going to get. At the moment, SVS is selling their non-pro SB1000, PB1000, SB2000 subwoofer models at attractive prices. It's a limited time sale. The other options are the SB2000 Pro and the 3000 Micro. He made cardboard models of the SB2000 and 3000 Micro, put their prices on them, and is letting his wife decide. <laughs> those are really the two I, w- I would go from from SVS. Yeah. W- those are definitely the two I would be looking at. Mm-hmm. She seems to like the 3000 Micro the best, but has not totally nixed the SB2000 form factor. So then the question becomes, is the SB2000 Pro at the exact same price as the 3000 Micro so much better in performance that would be worth it? You know, Um, versus the non-Pro version of the SB2000. So it's like, if the size is okay, and one of the reasons the slightly larger size, because the SB2000 is a pretty compact subwoofer, but the 3000 Micro is even smaller. So it would be, okay, we get the 3000 Micro and pay a bit more, but we get the even smaller size. Or we save some money and get the non-Pro version of the SB2000 and accept the little bit larger size, but save the money. Then there's like, okay, there is the SB2000 Pro, it is physically larger, and it's the same price as the 3000 Micro. So we're not getting any 
beneficial trade-off there is just is the SP2000 Pro so much better in performance than the SP2000 and the 3000 Micro that it would be worth the bigger size and the higher price tag out of the two. I'm going to say no. I am also going to say no <laughs> in this in this setup, in this scenario. Yeah. I yeah. I would I would probably lean towards saving the money cuz I think the SP2000 is a very like once you have it in the room, you're not going to have the 3000 micro there to compare it to side by side. Right. And to me the SP2000 they're is They're both a, small. Yeah, they're both very it's small. It's a nicely compact and I'm like they're on sale. I would I'd grab a couple of those and be very happy with the regular right. SP2000 in here. I would probably go in that same direction, but I could definitely see spending the extra money for the smaller the, right. the micro I mean, sub to be and honest, being okay with that. The, the 3000 micro and the SB2000, everywhere above 25 hertz, are basically equal. The SB2000 yeah. Pro gets a little bit louder than both of them, but I don't think sheer output is what you're worried about no, in this setup. No. I really don't. So I would either go for the tiniest of the tiny and pay the or little the bit more cheapest or the, the cheap, or yeah. the cheapest of them yeah absolutely yeah. i i don't think yeah. the 2000 pro is something that needs to be considered here yeah i don't really think that app control and the little bit extra output is going to do much no. for you so his other feature setup is a small dedicated theater in the basement only 10 by 15 and a half by seven foot eight inches mm -hmm. he'll be doing some renovations including soundproofing and that might shrink the dimensions even a bit more it will <laughs> unless that seven foot eight inches is a drop ceiling but yes so using his cardboard mock-ups even the sb2000 might be a tight <laughs> squeeze really i know <laughs> i don't know about that uh for this dedicated theater he really wants no compromise uh in terms of full 20 hertz pressurization can the 3000 micro deliver that despite its 23 hertz extension specs could the sb1000 pro do it since it's spec down to 20 hertz 15 and a half by 10 and a dedicated mm -hmm. i'm a, i'm assuming that this is a fully enclosed room i mean that sounds uh, like it yeah from yeah what i mean i think that the sb 1000 pro would probably be okay in here it would be right at the range where it's it you're you're gonna you're not gonna have a ton of headroom left on the thing but no I think not at 20 okay. hertz not at 20 i mean yeah. like i actually kind of worked out the math and with duels assuming you're putting the duels across the room from each other and not literally stacked on top of each other right right right. so across the room from one another getting about three decibels more output together uh i worked out the the specs that that uh, svs lists and you would reach minimum spec for reference volume with sb1000 pros even at 20 hertz which is you just have to get to 110 <laughs> right. at, at uh in the low frequency effects channel you would get there you wouldn't get to the full 115 um which is the maximum of uh reference volume so you'd reach minimum reference volume you wouldn't reach maximum <laughs> reference volume the sb2000 pros would get you one right. decibel shy of uh <laughs> of maximum if he somehow went with cylinder subs that would give you headroom to spare um because right. I, I mean if it's just footprint the cylinder subs might actually fit in here so my real answer though is he was like this is a future room that doesn't exist yet and i haven't built it yet and my right. real answer is don't, because I'm like, I think what he's thinking is, should I get these on sale SB2000s? Is that, no. I'm like, no, don't buy them right no. now. That This no. is not the time to buy. And by the time this room physically exists and is finished, there might be new subwoofer models. There might be a 3000 micro version two that hits hard down to yeah, 20 Yeah, model price like, might decide to make something small. Yep. By then, yep. you know. So they just started selling their... Uh, their uh, THX satellite speakers, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The website. little satellites are available now, yeah. Six-inch cubes. Yeah, That's and the driver are, is a... It's a four-inch driver, right? It's a four-inch yeah, driver. And I think they actually coaxial. listed it as concentric, not just coaxial. Yeah. I, I, interesting I, I, design. I didn't look too closely at it, but it's yeah. very... It looks good. So they might actually start making... I mean, yes. Never, ever, 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 ever buy gear for a place that doesn't exist yeah. or a system that is theoretical in nature yep and this this comes this to me is uh because i just wrote an article yesterday actually i haven't published it yet about uh av receiver shopping yeah and too often i see people say i might want to upgrade to atmos someday should i upgrade my receiver and the answer is no you upgrade your receiver when you upgrade to atmos yeah. do not buy 
a receiver because everybody else has Atmos and you don't, but you will live in the apartment and you can't put because the next thing you're going to do is like, well, maybe I should get some upfiring Atmos modules. I'm like, yeah. no. No, I think because we've wait. been going through these, you know, shortages and having to wait for yes. things that everybody's a little bit FOMO. But it, yeah, yes. in a case like this where the room doesn't exist yet, don't buy the subs yet. You'll be able yeah. to get subs when it's time. Every And this is, again, like we talked about with AV receivers and TVs and stuff like this all the time where we're like, every day you wait gives you access to potentially new mm-hmm. features that you don't have right now every day you wait i feel like you know you're getting closer and closer to supply chain issues getting <laughs> sorted out yeah, yeah yeah right now people are buying like andrew got if you've been following av gadgets he got the new onkyo rz50 i think is what he got uh no he got the nr7100 and that's one model yeah. so down. he got one yeah. of those yeah one model he got the the he got the onkyo because his denon went in for repair yeah and uh because it crapped out or something so they 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 he just bought that got it all set up he got his denim back sold it for the price he bought it yeah for. that's right you know because the used market right now is so insanely mm-hmm. hot so if you the longer you wait the hopefully the less problems you're going to have with that now it may be like the cryptocurrency guys buying up all the video processors or whatever it is and <laughs> the prices may never come down but chances are they're going to come down they're, they will subwoofers so. you'll be okay Bertrand Bertrand's father owns three rental properties they, they're all in need of a TV upgrade and his father would like to keep the price around $800 Canadian for each TV between 50 and 60 inches for the screen size the rooms are bright and sunlit although they're chalets by the water so the TVs mostly get used at night or if it's raining chalets mm-hmm. I don't see all right, looks like they're sitting in a corner, or at least this one is sitting One in of them's a... in a corner, one of them's in a, a TV cabinet that will get changed, because that's not going to fit a 55-inch TV. No, so he did no. mention that TV cabinet will get changed. Corners, yeah, a couple of like... them are corner setups. And yeah, bright rooms, not set up for you know proper acoustics. These are not home theaters. <laughs> He's just like, these these TVs that we have right now are really old. <laughs> we need some upgrades. 800 yeah. Canadian dollars for about 55 inches. What are we going to get? I've got some things F- in mind. Is it 55 to 50 and yeah, 50 50 to 60, 60 inches. So I'm, okay. I was looking at 55 inches. Yeah. yeah. So uh, LCD, you know, you want yes. something bright uh, for sure, because no matter that they're probably only going to be used, the chance you, you don't know, because mm-hmm. this these are rental properties. Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, rental properties. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my kids will sit there and, you know, they get access to cable TV for the first time in forever, and they'll just turn it on during the day and sit there while we're all trying to get them to go outside and do stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think you should go with something that's going to be okay in the, in, in the brighter environments yep. that they're in. And uh, so that's LCD. Uh, you know, if you can get full array local dimming, great. If not, then, you know, it's a rental property. Who cares? Yeah. He was also uh, <laughs> like, you know, should he worry about trying to get sound bars within the budget? Because the budget wasn't going to go up. He's like, should I worry about trying to get sound bars too? I'm like... I'm actually going to take audio into consideration and say, don't get a soundbar, but do choose a TV that has half decent speakers because some of them are really, really bad. So the two that I'm going to point you to, honestly, I think you should just get the Sony that I'm going to say, which is the 55 inch Sony X80. J. Uh, it's actually on sale at Canadian Best Buys right now for $800. It normally goes for $850. They're on sale for exactly $800 right now. And I think you should just get those Sony X80Js. Now, they don't have the greatest black levels ever, but they do get nicely bright, over 400 nits brightness, which at this price is pretty darn good. And one of the main things is uh, well, two main things. A, the built-in speakers are half decent. They're not terrible. They don't sound bad. They get pretty darn loud. Sony seems to be the only company that cares about the built-in TV speakers at all. So I like them on that front. And the interface, because this is Google TV that they're using, but it is a very user-friendly interface. Sony's are up to the task of running it well. So I like that overall. The only other one I would really maybe look at are TCL's R635. 
not even their more recent R646 because it is buggy as all get out with their implementation mm. of Google TV. People are still having tons of bug problems and the speakers are not that great in the R646. The R635 from a couple of years ago now, that was the Roku TV. It runs really smoothly. The built-in speakers are okay, uh, which is why I, I think overall the Sony X80J is the one to get. He was like, should I look at the Hisense U6G? I'm like, no, that interface is trash. You don't want people having to deal with the interface on that thing. And uh, Samsung's, you'd be looking at their AU8000 in this price range. Those speakers are the tiniest, worst things ever. They're mm. horrific, horrifically bad. You would need a sound bar for those, and there's just not available left in the budget. So to me, the Sony X80J tech checks all the boxes. It's at the price you want, and that's the one I would get. Okay. I, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, I was scrolling, so let me go back to where we were. There's Bertrand. Jason. Jason has a JVC NX7 projector, and the on command from his Harmony remote does not work consistently. Once he manages to turn the projector on, all the other commands work just fine. But on, right at the beginning, often doesn't work. Mm. And he's tried adding pauses and repeating the on command on his Harmony activities, but to no avail. It isn't just the Harmony remote that's to blame because the remote that came with the JVC has the same problem. He'll also, he'll often have to press the power on button multiple times before it actually works. So first up, any ideas that might help this issue? He does have a Sofa Baton X1 remote pre-ordered from Kickstarter, as do we all. <laughs> well, everybody here. I have a shipping number. It just I they have they have they told me it, was, it it's already arrived. I think uh, they as far, as far as they're concerned, <laughs> like we shipped it months ago. How come you haven't gotten I, it? Yet? I have a shipping number that leads nowhere. When I enter it into Canada Post, it comes up with nothing. <laughs> yeah. But if the original remote that came with the JVC has the issue, the X one might not solve it either. Mm. Uh, so any ideas what might help this issue? I uh, yeah, I call JVC and tell, ask him what the heck's going on with that because that that's very bizarre. It's you're right. If it's on the original remote yeah. and it's on the uh, it's not the receipt because normally what we would say is that there is something blocking or uh, obscuring the IR input. The IR and the JVC projector, the projector has an IR sensor on both the front and the back, and the back. of yeah. the projector. I'm not going to completely rule it out because we don't know what his setup is. And if right. what he's been used to is pointing the IR remote at his projection screen and relying on the bounce of the light right. off of the projection screen to the IR sensor on the front of the projector, which is a common thing to do and it usually works. But... Maybe his projector is slightly concealed behind a soffit. We don't know, or maybe. But all the S other commands are seem seem. All to the work, other commands so are seeming to work. That's yes, that's what's got that me. Is a bit uh, confusing. I, I I guess the other thing I would ask too is, have you made it? What changes recently have you made? Uh, to your theater that might explain mm. this? So like, oh, I decided to paint my screen my uh ceiling black yes you know if, if or my wall is black so uh, you know what, what rob is describing is this ir bouncing around your room and while the yeah. black shouldn't absorb the ir as it bounces around the room it could reduce the the, the strength, intensity yeah, of the, yeah, the, yeah. the reflections which could affect this and like you said uh any other uh any other uh, uh obstructions between mm -hmm. these two that were not a problem before are now becoming a problem. The other thing I might think too is that because power on and off are such important commands, it, they may be uh, more sensitive to less strong signals, if that makes sense. Like they only activate when it is very strong mm. versus something like the rest of the stuff that's like i'm already on if i sense something that seems <laughs> like it's asking me to, to switch to a different uh issue my input it does that pretty well the other thing too is what else do you do with your projector <laughs> you know, other than turn it on and off you know because when i am controlling my projector you know, doing anything other than that one thing, mm -hmm. which is turning it on and off, I usually look at it and say, what the heck is wrong with you? And I press the button <laughs> and face it. You know what I mean? Right. So it could be that all, if the other, I mean, I don't know, maybe he has a bunch of different lens shift yeah, and stuff like that be. that he's yeah, doing. Definitely. Or, but, or it uh, might change uh, uh, lamp modes when he goes to HDR, something like that. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I, I don't think that the sofa baton is going to fix anything. I would definitely call JVC. Yeah, it might be a, just an IR sensor issue in that unit itself. That's yeah. that's not out of the question. Um, but I would try to test, um, like, do you still, with the JVC's original remote I'm talking about, do you still need to press the on button multiple times if you have the remote, like, really close to the RS sensor. Because my thinking is, I don't know what version of Harmony Remote he has, but if it's one of the hub-based ones, you might want right. to take one of those little mini IR blasters that came with the hub. You'll probably need an extension cable because this is going to wherever your projector is mounted. But get one of those mini IR blasters and put it right next to one of the IR sensors. Because if the original JVC remote reliably works this on command when you have it like right up close, put it to the back of the projector, right up close to the IR sensor, and press it there. And if that that works reliably then it is just some kind of ir signal strength obstruction thing that's going on and having the little mini blaster from your harmony hub right yeah. next to that sensor cleaning that the front of your work. projector might be or the back wherever your yeah, yeah, ir is, is going yeah. in from yeah. yeah might also help i'll tell you what i do in my system is i have one of the it, it's like a half moon little ir you know blaster thingy that that you plug into the back. So the Harmony mm -hmm. hub itself yeah. is an IR blaster. It just blasts it does, out yeah. everything. So I put near my gear, mm -hmm. and, and there's glass shelves everywhere, mm -hmm. and it just it's it hits everything. It's enough reflection that it gets everywhere. But it's around. It's kind of in a closet around the mm -hmm. corner from the projector. So I take this little IR blaster, and I put it on the ground, and I just make sure it has basically a line of sight yep. to the projector. But if somebody knocks it over, i.e. big old dogs mm -hmm. that don't live here, then uh, the projector won't turn on. Yeah. So I have to flip it back over and then press the button and it, and it does. So could be could be just that you need a, a better line of sight. Yeah, and actually, if and when that Sofa Baton X1 does arrive, its hub has the little extenders for the additional right. IR blasters that come with it. So that might be, if you don't have a Harmony hub, based remote if you've got you know a 650 that's just a remote then the x1 might solve this issue via sure. having that uh, little mini ir blaster that you could put right close to the jvc skype glitch so you gotta notice that there's a firmware uh, i know i saw it he he's got uh notice that there's a firmware update available for the jvc it mentions bug fixed for external control command boy that Sounds like it might fix your problem as well. <laughs> but it also warns that various settings will be reset to factory defaults and the menu structure will be renewed. It also warns that pin cushion correction function will be removed. So do not update if you want to continue using that feature. Uh, pin cushion correction function. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, does that sound like it might help his power on issue? And should he worry about that pin cushion thing since he doesn't know what it is? His projector is set up 12 feet away from 120 inch fixed frame silver ticket screen which makes me think that that's important because rob asked that question <laughs> uh well regardless if you're going to do this update i would go through your settings and make sure you know what yes, everything is because i think it will basically do be doing a factory reset factory where reset, all yeah. of your uh, picture set and maybe not maybe it won't change all the picture mode settings but it might it sounds like right. it might so yes definitely have everything written down beforehand i don't know the the bug fix for external control sounds like like an rs232 thing or right. you know custom install type of thing so but it might be worth a try as long as you're willing to re-enter all your settings uh pin cushion correction is specifically if you have an external anamorphic lens if you have an external anamorphic lens in front of your projector for your CinemaScope screen, then one of the distortions that can happen to the image when it goes through an additional lens is what they call pin cushioning or inverse pin cushioning, where the middle of the top and the middle of the bottom of the image kind of bow out or sometimes bow in, which would be inverse pin cushioning. So as long as you don't have an external anamorphic lens <laughs> that you're using, you don't have to worry about pin cushion correction. Mm. I'm just looking on the back of the, the JVC. It does have an RS-232 port. Oh, yes, it does, yeah. Just making sure. Yeah, yeah because... It has an IR in as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, wait. That's it. Oh. We're on to J. No, I know, but I, somehow I scrolled back up to the top. Ah. I don't know how I did that. J. J asks, how do we like a Yamo Studio S series speakers for the price? He'd like an upgrade, particularly in terms of stereo separation and imaging over his Polk T50 towers. Let me look at these JVs. It's Yamos. Yeah, Sorry. so these Yamos, uh, when they're measured, they have a bit of a smiley face curve to them. 
this is not surprising. <laughs> uh, it, uh, many people find it quite this pleasing. This price range, yeah, for yeah. sure. Uh, but it means that the uh, the the mid bass, the actual mid bass uh, of like you know around 250 hertz, is tipped up a bit, and the treble is tipped up a bit. So they sound a little bit more detailed than truly neutral, and they sound like they have a little bit more heft or warmth to them than is truly neutral. But a lot of people find that sound very very pleasing. I really like their looks. Uh, for this price range, I think that they look mm-hmm. nicer than a lot of other speakers in this price they class. Do. Um, I don't have much of a beef with their sound. Like, are they the most neutral, accurate speakers ever? Objectively, no. But it's also Odyssey the sort can of fix that. Yeah, a little bit of <laughs> EQ can fix it quite. Like, it's not egregious. It's not like right, they're right. they're crazy. You know, treble high bass high speakers. They've just got a. a rather pleasant smiley face curve I mean, to them. So the, high, the, the highest price I can find on these things is like $400. Is that a pair? For the towers. A pair? Yeah. For the towers. That's right. It's, 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 and it's the bookshelves in, are like $170 yeah. for a pair. Yeah. So, I mean, are, the question really is, though, are these an upgrade over the Polk uh, T50 right. towers? They'd sound you different, know? mainly because yeah. of the slightly tipped up treble in the Yamos versus the slightly rolled off treble in the Polks. So, right. And I, as we, you we well know, that it's, it, it, it's much easier to tame something that's tipped up than it is to boost something right. that's, that's reduced like that. Yeah. So odyssey may have an easier time mm-hmm. making these sound a little bit more even than uh they are flat. Uh, the yamos are also very easy to drive they're not like as efficient right. as a clipsch horn loaded speaker but they're very efficient speakers so they're uh, easy to drive. like my instinct is if if you're the sort of person who would think okay more noticeable detail crispier sounding details in the treble and it just kind of easily got louder because most people aren't going to really adjust where they set their volume dial. Like if all of those things sound quite appealing to you, I think you would really like the Yamo Studios. And if you like their looks, I'm really on board with them because I think their looks are an advantage, particularly at this price point. So I really have no beef with them. I'm not going to tell you they're the last word in utter accuracy because I don't believe right. that to be true. But if you like how they look and you want more detail in particular in the treble, I think you'd be happy with them. That's my take. Yeah, I'm looking at them on Amazon. I mean, you can get them for really mm-hmm. cheap on Amazon, which is kind of yep. ludicrous. You can get them at Crutchfield, uh, too. They're always on sale at Crutchfield. Yeah, 360 for a pair of the 809s. The problem is, is they don't have free returns, which is kind of mm. to be expected. So I would, I would have to hear i would want you to hear them sure. you know but i mean bring in one pair of the bookshelves them. you know one pair of the bookshelves is going to be cheap in shipping so yeah one would hope so yeah. you know just something to think about mark mark recently moved into a new house there's a finished room in the basement roughly 14 and a half by 25 and a half feet long with a drop tile ceiling there's a jut in in the rear left corner so the room is not a perfect rectangle the jut in is about five feet long and three feet wide uh okay so we've got a diagram to start. It's basically a rectangle, but with a chunk taken out of the rear left corner. Yes. Uh, since the room is already finished with drywall, he would strongly prefer not to do any major demolitions. Smaller modifications are fine. He already owns an Epson 5040 UV projector with a 2.35 to 1 acoustically transparent silver, silver ticket screen. The diagonal screen size is 142 since it's 2.35 to 1. That's the same width as 150 inch. Uh, 16 by 9, which is 131 inches wide. He prefers to say 11 to 12 feet from the screen. He's got a mix of speakers, some Cambridge, some Polk, and sonnets in ceilings. He'll get around to upgrading them one day, but he can use what he has for the time being. And he has a pair of S- uh, HSU subs. Shoe subs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denon X3600H receiver, plus an expensive two-channel amp to power a full 7.2.4 setup in the Panasonic UB40. Uh, 420 and then xbox uh, one for sources so starting with the overall layout he can't really picture setting up this room in any way other than what he's shown in his diagram so i guess thanks for asking <laughs> uh, he doesn't uh want the room being wider than this long which i can understand mm-hmm. and flipping the room 180 degrees would put the screen in front of the closet doors that hide the water system for the house plus there's a the jut in making that side of the room narrower so we agree with the general layout uh of his diagram right 
I mean, we're supposed to say yes because <laughs> you said you're not going to change it full stop. It's just because he has questions about the <clears throat> door placement, but he's like, is there yeah. is there really any alternative? And I mean, honestly, the only alternative would be to turn it 90 degrees somehow and have the theater be wider than long. That's really the only alternative I right, could come up with. Your, I, don't, your... I don't think keeping it the way that you have is a problem, so I'm yeah. quite happy to leave it this way. <laughs> So it looks like we, so he's got, so the back left corner, just so you guys understand, back left corner has uh, that jut in that we talked mm -hmm. about, uh, comes five feet into the room from the back and three feet into the room from the left. Mm -hmm. and, but there's a door in the front left corner. That's right. That is the, is the issue here, which basically has his entire uh, theater area, if you want to call it, offset to the right. Yeah, it's, it's basically everything is pushed over to the right wall rather than yeah. being centered in the entire room. That's that's more or less what's gone on here. Which is fine. Uh, though I will, I think I have some suggestions for this, okay. but we will see. Oh, I, I see there's more pictures. Yep, there's more coming up. <laughs> yeah, I would not uh, I would not turn this. He's got sconces on the right wall too, it yes. looks like. Maybe even on the left as well. And there's a... There are, yeah. There's sconces on both sides. And then there's what was not mentioned is that there is a column on the left as well in the front, like almost the front left corner. There's a column. There. Yeah, which comes in the same amount as the jut in of the yeah, of the so. uh, rear left corner there. So, yeah, you don't really yeah. have the entire what 15 foot width that isn't really no. present. Okay. So for the front wall, uh, the door to this theater room is on the left wall up at the front. From inside the theater, the whole wall looks like a solid drywall, but that's actually there's actually a door concealed behind that front wall that leads to an adjacent room. It, it's covered over and totally unusable right now. <laughs> oh, I see. That's the other room? That's the other room. So in the other room, they, there's a door that should lead into the theater, but somebody has erected some framing and put up some drywall so that in the theater, it just looks like a flat front wall. So there's a completely unusable door that exists behind the front wall of the theater. Stupid. It's a little bit weird. <laughs> uh, he was thinking he would like to have that door accessible, but instead of it being a path between two rooms, it would just open to the back of a false wall that he would build for his acoustically transparent screen, giving him access to the area behind the false wall. However, the false wall would not be the entire width of the front wall because of the door to the theater, which he doesn't want to deconstruct and move at all. So what do we think so do we think all of that makes sense? Have a false wall up front, but leave the space on the left hand side of the uh, for the theater door to open and then have the door to the adjacent room act as access to the rear of the false wall. He's cobbled together a rough idea of what the wall would look like with his screen and the closet door acting as the edges of the potential fa false wall. So he's got some kind of pictures here, I guess. Whatever. Yeah, this is like a look coming into the theater and like he's just put up this closet door for how deep the false wall would be and uh, and then showing what the clearance would be because you wouldn't have the full width clearance as you like come in the door and then shimmy to the right to get around the false wall. Right. Uh, so honestly, honestly, here's my, my thought on this. You have... Um, a cinemascope screen, so it's not as tall as a 16 by 9 screen would be. I would not bother with a false wall whatsoever. That's I, I, my genuine kind of take on this. Thing. I would install yeah. your speakers around your screen. I would put the screen directly on the existing drywall of that front wall. I would not bother opening up the door that does exist behind that drywall, but I would just leave it alone, and I wouldn't have a false wall at the front of this room at all. I'd just mount your fixed frame screen like a regular non-acoustically transparent fixed frame screen, I would put your speakers around it. That That's my So the problem take. with that is that I see at least is that he doesn't have a lot of space on the right side. No, I mean you would still be offset to the right just because of where that column is. That that column that's no, over no. there on the left. But on the right side of the screen for yeah. the speaker. I know, so but would... it's, it's enough to have a speaker like right in the, it's good the speaker's going to be right in the corner anyway even if it's behind the screen. Yeah. So I I guess that's cuz I'm looking at the screen and there's and where the door opens. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could cheat it a little bit more to the left. You're going to have to... Just a little, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to put some sort of stopper to make sure that your door doesn't open up into your screen. I know what you're thinking. I have an acoustically transparent screen. Why am I not using my acoustically transparent screen? Because well, you moved house. Well, because you moved. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Uh, and why don't you sell it and get some of your money back for it and buy a 16 by 9 screen like a normal person? Uh, that Because that's what <laughs> I would do. I would get a screen that was taller sure. and 
f- fill up more of that wall. I mean, up you there. also you have you have complete flexibility on where your seats go in this room. There is absolutely nothing saying where your seats have to go lengthwise in this room. So even right. if you uh, ended up going to a smaller screen size, you just sit a bit closer. Because, I mean, you have the equivalent of a screen that would be 150 inches if it's the same width. If you went down to one that's 135, but you sit gives one you and a half room feet on closer, either side. it gives you more Yeah, room. it gives you more room on the side to put your speakers, yeah. too, which I know he's going to hate, but the fact that he's but, I mean, somehow that, going to a smaller it, screen. It's my genuine take on, like, that. that's how I would handle this. Now, if he's like, nope, I've got to <laughs> have me a false wall... Um, I'm not like completely objecting to what he is like. I think what he has proposed is kind of the only way you can do it if you yeah. do build a false wall. I mean, the other option would be: Do you actually take down the drywall that's there and have your false wall recess into the adjacent room? Because that's the other alternative, right? You you take. Right. I don't know how load bearing that wall is though. So let's not it doesn't mess look around. very load bearing based on these pictures. Yeah, that's for based sure. based on what we're seeing on the other side of that wall. But I mean, some of that might be load bearing, but you don't have to take down the entire frame. But I'm, yeah, if recessing it into the adjacent room is an option, I might do that. That would be the only other alternative. Uh, but if if he does exactly what he's proposed. Like, that works. It's a little bit awkward coming into the room because immediately as you come through the theater door, you're sort of shimmying to your right and you've got this so, slight obstruction in front of you. But it's not the end of the world. If you I'm going to be honest with you. Like, the big solution to everything that's going on in this room right mm-hmm. here is that stupid door in the front left, right? It sure. opens into the room. Yeah. Which is problematic in this case. Now, I don't know what's on the other side of that door, mm-hmm. but... Oh, just have it, it swing the other way? Just have it open out? <laughs> just switch the door so it opens <laughs> You're out. Right. And then you can reposition the screen. You can reposition yeah. your seats. You can reposition everything so that everything works better. Yeah, because that's not now, deconstructing the door way. That's just no. changing the hinges. You put the, the hinges way. on the other side. Now, that, I don't know what's on the other side of that. Maybe you yeah, can't yeah, yeah. do that for some reason. I mean, we have but... a little bit of a glimpse out. And I mean, it looks like it's just a hallway. So can you have the door swing out into the if hallway? If that door swings out, yeah, because that's what it looks yeah. like. That door swings <laughs> out, it might be, it might solve every single problem right. you have in this room. Yeah, you're right. Okay, there's the easiest solution of all. And then you can keep your false wall plans. Although the false walls still cannot go all the way to the left wall. To the wall, it right, right. literally go in front of the door. Because he doesn't want to move the door, clearly. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah. want to move the door, which is fine. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, but you're not moving the door. You're just switching the sides. Yeah. And uh, that's really... Okay. I mean, technically I can do it because I've done it. But uh, I don't want to <laughs> because it's a pain. It's a lot of mess. So that's I pay somebody else to do every it. way at coming of at coming at this problem. I still prefer just not having a false wall whatsoever. Because to me, that's the simplest solution. But uh, but yeah, having this door swing out and then putting in this false wall, or having the false wall recess into the adjacent room, if that's doable. Those are all the ways we come at this. Well, like you said, I mean, uh, the false wall itself. You know, if you ended up with in-wall speakers behind your screen, mm. it could be mounted on the wall. Yeah. And then you could use your current speakers for now and then eventually plan to upgrade to in-wall speakers behind your yep, screen. That's another way, yeah. And then, uh, and then you get that because if, if the if the problem is is I want a clean look, yes, which is perfectly reasonable Absolute. thing to want, then uh, my solution still works, which is flip the door, yeah. mount the screen to the wall. Use your speakers as they are for right now, and then eventually upgrade to something in wall that goes yeah, behind. behind the screen. Yeah. Okay. Multiple solutions. As far as the framing for the false uh, wall at the front, how many studs are needed? Could they be as far as four feet uh, apart from each other? And how does the construction? Uh, how does he construct the top plate with the drop tile ceiling that is already in place? Could he attach the top plate for the false wall to the metal T bars of the drop tile ceiling, or maybe not have the top plate attached at all, just rely on it being secured to the front wall, uh, right side wall, and floor? Uh, I do not do construction, <laughs> and I have no idea. But I am absolutely certain you cannot attach it to that those T bars that you, are coming from that drop you tile. Do ceiling. not attach it to the metal <laughs> T bars. No, I mean the way you do this is you actually take down the metal T yeah. bars in that section, 
you put the top plate to the joists that are above those T-bars, uh, just like you would regular framing, and then you redo the little bit of section of T-bars that you need to, to have the drop tile ceiling now come to the front of the fr a false wall instead of the physical wall that's already constructed. Yeah. So this is a little bit of deconstruction. This is by no means taking down the entire uh, drop tile ceiling. It's nothing close to that. It is removing the portion that you need to so that you can have the top plate connected to the uh, joist. And that's really the only way to do it. The framing, I mean, it certainly does not need to be 16 inches on center. Right. I don't usually go as far as four feet from each other for the studs. So 24 inches on center is sort of standard. I, I think that's the safe answer, to be honest. I mean, even though this isn't load bearing whatsoever. I think if you went four feet, you would have to put some sort of bracing in there to keep it from... Yeah, like even just hanging your screen on there or having your uh, speakers on shelves in behind there, like you're going to find it wobbly <laughs> yeah. if they're that. So I would go 24 inches on center. And how would he acoustically treat behind the false wall? Would it just be an empty space, no studs to hold anything? He'd have his front three speakers back there. I mean, just stack up. Just stack, stack some up insulation. insulation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's literally, you don't have to attach it to anything. Yeah. You just stack it up. I mean, this is one everything. where I would probably get the Roxel. Uh, because yeah, Roxel is Roxel actually in many cases Roxel is cheaper than fiberglass installation now it depends on where you are but uh, it, yeah. it's certainly not grossly more expensive and while it's not rigid it's semi-rigid so it's very easy to stack Roxel and that's all you do I mean you just stack some Roxel and stack it around your speakers and you don't have to do anything else to it because it's all hidden behind your false wall that's right uh, and what's the best fabric to use to cover the false wall? And we've talked about this a lot recently. In fact, I think I wrote the article, but I don't know yeah. if I published it. Uh, basically talking about, you know, when when you know you want to do, uh, you want to black out your room but not uh, use uh, paint, mm -hmm. you know, you can use fabric to do so, but you always want to make sure that you're using something that's fire retardant or fire rated mm -hmm. or whatever the thing is so we know that everything over at Acoustamac does that yeah so that's yeah what we would recommend. yeah everything at Acoustamac, their dmd fabric is absolutely fine and i would be happy to use that you could use their suede although you wouldn't want your speakers to come through the suede because the suede blocks a little bit of sound but if the speakers are coming through your acoustically transparent screen and not through right. the suede and the suede is just there so that your acoustic treatment is still effective it's fine it for fine. that purpose yeah. and the suede looks really nice they also do just sell regular guilford of maine that costs more than either their standard dmd fabric or the suede fabric uh but you have that option they also have their executive fabric which is like in between DMD and Guilford of Maine. It's uh, more expensive than DMD, not quite as expensive as Guilford of Maine, and quality-wise looks a lot like Guilford of Maine, so maybe you'll like the executive fabric the best. But they're all good. They're all fire-rated, and they're all acoustically transparent, the suede being not wholly acoustically transparent. So about the, that drop tile ceiling, he would much prefer to make it black. It's just standard cheap white ceiling tiles right now. He looked into getting all black ceiling tiles, but it seems like it would be expensive. Could he just paint the existing black tiles black? And what should be done above the ceiling tiles? It's just empty space above them right now. Should he insulate up there? Would that reduce the amount of treatment he would need for the rest of the room? Uh, in theory, if what you had up there were acoustic tiles, which it doesn't sound like they are. It just yeah. sounds like they're just the regular... You know, thin, cheap, which makes sense. Yeah. Somebody finished this basement, so that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the the benefits of having the, the drop tile ceiling is that, you know, it's easy to access everything that's up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to turn it into one big, ginormous base trap, mm -hmm. uh, which you can do. The downside is that it is more expensive to do so than it is to just put drywall on your ceiling. And it is not soundproof. Uh, it is not you, soundproof. You do not have right. a solid, kind. continuous yeah. barrier. Um, so, I mean, there are the ceiling tiles that have solid backing, and they are yeah. more soundproof than regular ceiling tiles, even what's called acoustic ceiling tiles, which is basically just almost rigid insulation is what acoustic ceiling tiles are. Those are not soundproof. There are uh, ceiling tiles with solid backing, but they are expensive, like you talk about. Um, there is a brand, and we have to thank, uh, oh, who was it? Was it Daz? Might have been Maybe. Daz. I'm pretty sure it was Daz because he was looking into black ceiling tiles for his drop tile ceiling. Uh, there's the brand Certainteed. Certainteed has their theater black 
ceiling tiles, which are acoustic ceiling tiles. I think they're available in both one and two inch thicknesses. These are not the soundproofing ones. They don't have a solid back, but they're the regular ins insulation uh, acoustic ceiling tiles. And they are black and they are considerably less expensive than everybody else's black ceiling tiles. Um, they're not like cheap, cheap, but they're much more affordable. So we'll have the link that takes you directly to them. You can look for uh, a reseller in your area and at least just check it out. Do not paint the existing ceiling yeah. tiles. Uh, acoustically, that is going to be a bit of a nightmare because uh, that w what little acoustic benefit they have right now, you're just taking that away by putting solid paint over all of it. I would just cheapest insulation you can get fill all the ceiling joist bays with the cheapest insulation you can put up there i would absolutely do that it does now work like a giant base trap in your ceiling so you don't have to worry too much about base trapping the rest of your room and if you get those uh certain teed black theater uh ceiling tiles you've you've really acoustically treated a good portion of that you know 15 to 30 percent surface area that we want to so i kind of like that so the back closet, uh, inside the back closet is unfinished and it's just concealing the water system for the house, which it's uh, like a, it's accordion doors that open yep. up and there's carpet that leads up to it. And then there's um, then it stops. <laughs> concrete and then there's those water pump system that's back there. Yep. And in case it spills, there's some buckets, five gallon, five gallon buckets mm -hmm. back there just in case. So, you know, very high tech. <laughs> uh, there also looks to be a subwoofer box in there uh, he was wondering should he take down the entire back wall and closet doors to open up that space he was thinking he could actually have another false wall back there and then his rear subwoofer and back surround back speakers plus his gear rack and projector could all be hidden within the current uh closet space what do we think of that idea i hate it i i hate that <laughs> idea <laughs> uh let me tell you from experience my good man accordion doors not good in the home theater mm. okay i took mine down okay and, like within seconds of having a home theater in my room there was a there's an accordion door system here mm -hmm. and uh because it's a bedroom and i took that those down immediately because the second the subwoofer started hitting mm you knew where the accordion doors were. So replace so, the closet doors. That's I would actually finish that wall. That would be my But you still thing. need access to the You have thing. to put a door on you it. You gotta have a door, yes. yeah. But I would just finish it and make it finished. So just, I think just that, have a regular width door, not a yes. closet door, a regular width yes. door that opens up. Okay. I know you don't want to do that, but uh you're gonna just hate those accordion doors okay. back there. But uh, I don't like the idea of taking down that entire back no. wall and just having that whole space open. I don't like that at all. Uh, I mean, there's you can see the insulation. It, I yeah. mean, there's just it, it's just open in the ceiling. There's nothing up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to finish the ceiling at the very least. And I don't. I, what's behind that? Is that the exterior? That's wall the exterior or? wall. Yeah, that's just the. Yeah. So... No, I, I would keep. I would keep the appearance of a wall there. I do agree with Tom. I would at the very least replace the closet doors, if not outright, you know, extend the wall and just have a regular width door back there. But I would not take all that down and I would not turn that all into a, a false wall situation where the, the water system, the water system makes some noise. I want that behind a solid barrier. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then you got to think about the fact that, uh, so I would insulate that wall to give you some sort of sound barrier between you and the water system sure. but it probably extends above mm -hmm. and into the area above your uh your drop tile ceiling so you know you're gonna have to you're gonna end up in here and, and notice I, unless you have the world's quietest water system mm -hmm. you're gonna know when someone's taking a shower when you're watching a movie sure. like that is or if someone's doing the dishes or something like that you're gonna know so you're gonna i think you're gonna end up asking us how can i soundproof this yeah. and the solution is to seal put off that wall back, back wall. up yeah <laughs> seal off that back wall yeah. put in a, a, a solid core door or something mm. and you know insulate that wall at the very very least and if it's not going all the way up to the joists up there mm. then you're going to want to make sure it, that wall does mm. and then you're going to want to at, at the very least fill those joists up with as much insulation as your little fingers can squeeze in there <laughs> uh just to try to block as much sound coming through in and back into your theater as humanly possible all right. 
I need coffee. But uh, Jeremy in France. We might recall that Jeremy was helping his brother Anthony set up his first home theater in a small guest room. On our advice, he wound up going with the Sib Evo speakers from Focal along with a Dan receiver plus the SVS PB1000 that he already owned. The last time Jeremy, Jeremy wrote us, his brother had set things up himself and was saying the voices sounded muffled. <laughs> I just wondered what that looked like. <laughs> Jerry was going to visit him later that week, so we gave some suggestions. Now he's back to report the results and to ask a few more questions. That's not good. <laughs> Nothing was crazy about his brother's setup, but all five speakers were pointing directly at the middle seat because he looked at the diagrams online. And uh, that's crappy. fair enough. We don't blame his brother at all for having done that. Yeah. And Odyssey had not been run. So... Uh, Jeremy aimed the speakers properly, especially the surrounds that ran Odyssey prior to running. Odyssey voices were indeed somewhat difficult to make out, and there was almost an echo to the sound up front. It sounds much better now, and his brother is happy with the setup and results. Naturally, he asked Jeremy what Odyssey does and how it had helped so much. Jeremy had to admit he wasn't really sure how to explain it, so can we? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, he sort of gets that it adjusts volumes of all the speakers and then plays with some of the different frequencies, but I wasn't quite sure if it even plays a role when you don't listen at reference volume, and he just wasn't sure how to explain it all. So, um, I mean, obviously, either one of us can explain this, but I need coffee. Okay, so, so off I go then. Um, so, uh, I'll answer that first part. For it, it definitely plays a role um, when you are not listening at reference volume, particularly if you are using Odyssey's dynamic EQ, uh, which is specifically meant for situations where you are not listening at full reference volume. Uh, so we'll come back to the round. I'll swing back around to the beginning. At the most basic, uh, what the auto setup is doing is it's using microphone measurement position number one. Having gone through it, you know that you end up moving the microphone around to multiple positions. But microphone position number one is very important. That should be equidistant from your front left and right speakers to start. It should be where an ideal perfect primary seat would be, the exact same distance and right in between your front left and right speakers. And even if you don't physically have a seat that is right there, maybe it's offset or maybe you have a love seat and the two seats are actually on either side of that precise location, right bang there in the middle, equidistant from the front left and right speakers is where microphone position number one should be. And based on that, it sets your levels uh, your trim levels, and your distances. So to explain to someone who isn't into all this uh, why that's important and what that means, just imagine that a sound, uh, a given sound, a little ping is played from every single speaker one at a time, and then it's played from all of the speakers simultaneously. Okay, the idea is that that very same ping sound coming from any speaker if it played from all of your speakers at the same time, that ping should arrive at your ears at that perfect spot, that central spot that is equidistant and in between your front left and right speakers. That ping should arrive from all of the speakers at the same time, at the same volume. Every single speaker should deliver that ping to that spot, microphone position number one, at the same time, at the same volume. And that is what your trim levels and your distances are being set for. That's the purpose, is so that they all arrive at the same time to that mic position number one at the same volume. So once we have that, and that could explain why without having run Odyssey, there might've been this echo, because if the center speaker is say, uh, closer to your listener than your front left and right speakers, the sound from the center speaker is gonna arrive that little bit sooner. And because it's arriving that little bit sooner than the sound that's coming from the front left and right speakers comes to your ears in time a little bit behind the center speaker that leads to that little bit of echo, that little bit of smearing of the sound makes voices hard to understand because some of the voice is coming out of the front left and right speakers as well as the center. And that might have been enough to do it. So having everything time aligned so that it's all arriving at the same time and then volume aligned so that it's all coming at the same volume that it should. Now everything is calibrated in that way. So that's part of what the auto setup does. Then it equalizes things so that if you play a sweep, that whole sweep will be the same volume throughout the entire sweep. So that's the correction that Odyssey does. Then there's the Odyssey dynamic EQ. And what that is saying is at full reference volume, we're just gonna play the signal as is. But when you turn the master volume down, because our hearing is not linear, when we turn down the volume, 
Uh, we lose the ability to hear bass frequencies and we lose the ability to sounds to hear sounds that are behind us and above us more quickly than we lose the ability to hear uh, mid-range sounds and voices and things that are coming from in front of us. We're more attuned to the vocal range in particular and in front of us than we are to bass frequencies and things behind us and above us. So Odyssey Dynamic EQ aims to keep everything audible. It aims so that if you turn the volume, master volume down uh, 15 or 20 decibels, some of the sounds in the bass and some of the sounds behind you and above you, we're just not going to hear them anymore. They are objectively coming down in volume the same amount as mid-range sounds, vocal sounds in front of us, but our brain doesn't perceive it that way. Our brain perceives it as though they got more quiet <laughs> than right. the vocal sounds in front of us. So Odyssey Dynamic EQ keeps everything audible. It keeps the bass audible. It keeps those sounds behind you and above you audible. So it has a big impact at volumes other than reference volume if you have Odyssey right. Dynamic EQ turned on. So yeah, I think that explains... The main thing is that whole idea, the sounds, if you played a ping from all the speakers at the same time, it arrives to that mic position number one at the same time at the same volume. Right, the trim and the distance levels are two of the things that uh, I think are least well understood, and mm. it's partially because of the uh, name, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it's also just because it it, it it it's not as intuitive as it as it should sound. That's why when yeah. we get things like um, uh, you know the distance on a sub is somehow so much so wrong, it's because it's not an actual distance it's, it's the delay yeah you know and that's yeah, bass that, frequencies that, being so long they're reflecting around your room yeah. you're not hearing them until they've had a chance <clears throat> to fully form in the room so yes your, will, your subwoofer setting might have a very strange distance attached right. to it that doesn't uh line up with a tape measure whatsoever but so like what rob alone. said about uh dynamic volume mm -hmm. one thing i see online and it seems to me based on your questions uh you listen to us, you do, mm -hmm. we know you do, uh, but you also read things online sure. that have you a little bit confused, which is perfectly fine. It happens to a lot of people. A lot of people I see will say, run Odyssey, turn on dynamic volume, uh, turn on, yeah, dynamic uh, EQ dynamic EQ, and dynamic volume. And like there, there is a mistake there, okay? Dynamic EQ, yes. Mm -hmm. Dynamic volume, no. Okay? Although I will say, if it's a situation late at night, where you sure, just don't want different. there to be big swings in volume, because I didn't explain what dynamic volume is. Dynamic volume is dynamic range compression. The simple way to understand right. that is quiet <laughs> sounds get louder, louder sounds get quieter. So that so when everything... you change the volume, yeah, yeah. just think of commercials. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. just equalizes all that stuff. So that so, that can be helpful, like late at night, where yeah. you know there's portions it, of the movie where people are whispering, and then there's a big explosion. But because you're watching late at night, you don't actually want there to be a big change in volume. Turning on Odyssey dynamic volume for that instance can be very helpful because it makes the whispers louder and the uh, explosion quieter. Yeah, but don't just look at anything that says Odyssey and say, yes, it must be good, it's Odyssey. It is, <laughs> it, the dynamic volume in particular should not be engaged sure. unless you are being thoughtful about yeah. it. It is not a blanket statement. Dynamic EQ is a blanket statement. It should <laughs> be engaged at all times, yeah. you know, because it, it, it is literally helping you hear things more accurately. He said, after running Odyssey, you checked the results and it sets negative trim levels for all the speakers. Jeremy thought it best. It was best if all the trim levels were as close to zero as possible. No, no, please. No, no. I know you read that somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, there's this whole thing about how your subwoofer EQ should negative, never be negative or subwoofer <laughs> trim level should never be negative because it somehow clips it or, or that it should never be positive. There's never that. positive. I've seen, I've seen that clips side it. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it literally doesn't matter. These settings <laughs> in here, I, 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 I honestly wish people wouldn't look at them. Like I wish mm. they weren't available to look at as much. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, at least when you're doing like the whole Odyssey thing, it just should, just should give you some blanket thing. You should have to go into a different menu. Mm. 
that says manual adjustment where you then see what Odyssey has done. So that most people would just go, Odyssey says, you know, volume level equal, volume level equal all the way down or something like that. And then it's and then they don't show the actual settings <laughs> because it, it, the negative numbers and sometimes the positive, the positive numbers freak people out. So he mentally he manually adjusted all these numbers, bringing them to uh, bring the trim level of every speaker by, up by the same amount, so that some of them were st uh, still a negative number. But after they listened to the results, his brother said to just put them back the way Odyssey had said it, and Jeremy had to admit that it did sound better. But does that make any sense? Would changing the trim levels by all by the same amount make an audible difference? I mean, yeah, <laughs> you, it, it's exactly that. that it, it should make it louder yeah. audibly and i mean it does it, that does have an impact on odyssey dynamic eq because <coughs> odyssey exactly. dynamic eq is no longer accurate uh, right. if you change the trim levels that odyssey set what i would basically say is odyssey as long as you put microphone position number one where it should be it's a very important microphone position mic yeah. position number one but as long as you put that microphone where it should be for position number one when you begin the measurements Odyssey nails the trim levels and the distances. It nails them. It's I've, not just Odyssey. They yeah. almost Actually, all of them. Of them too. Yeah. I mean, I, that's even the crappy Akio, uh, REQ, whatever they're calling yeah. it, calling it these days, even that one does the distance and the yeah. trim levels just yeah. fine. Yeah. So this is like by far the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it's the thing that most people are like, well, that can't possibly be right. <laughs> but like, I mean, really? <laughs> it also makes complete sense that all the trim levels were negative numbers because you're in a very <laughs> small, small room, room, very close yeah. to the these speakers so yeah. it completely makes sense that you'd have negative tr numbers for the trim levels and right. they are proper it means that when the master volume is set to zero db you will be at proper reference volume that's what right. it means and it means that it had to turn down the signal because you're sitting very close to these speakers in a very small room and why does it sound better with them set the way that odyssey set it versus you is because now you are now keeping the volume level lower to get the same relative volume than odyssey is expecting it mm. to be at if that makes sense so it is no longer adjusting those curves of equal loudness yes it's no longer adjusting the dynamic eq correctly so that everything sounds even because mm -hmm. remember we're not talking about you're know, like well if i boosted it all by 3 db then everything's just a little bit just a little bit louder it should still sound all exactly the same but it's not adjusting at the same db you know across all frequencies at all volumes. So as you lower the volume and you are lowering it by at least three dB to get the mm -hmm. same, you know, relative volume at what, you know, whatever your volume you're normally listening at, dynamic EQ is no longer doing the same thing. Yeah. It's adjusting it less than it might have, or maybe a little bit more than it might have. And that's making it sound now uneven because of what you did. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that it no longer sounds as good. It's a case of just leave it, let it do its thing, man. Just let it do <laughs> its thing. On that front, it's absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Kiran, and he's from India, or she is from India. Kiran, I don't know, that name doesn't have a gender for, him, for me. Kiran says he's, okay. I did Stand make corrected. an assumption there. <laughs> did, uh, did you? I looked it up, though. and it We is can't a, do that anymore. Well, I looked we it can't. up. It's it's traditionally a, a male Indian name, so that's that's what I went with. Uh, I'm not going, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with your pronouns says they've been listening <laughs> to the to our podcast for about a year one thing that has become very clear from listening to us is that dual subwoofer placement is important and dialing them in just right can sometimes take a lot of trial and error depending on the site the shape of your room mm -hmm. sometimes it takes no trial and error <laughs> if you have a rectangular room so they've been uh they've noticed that a lot of custom installers strongly prefer to use in-wall subwoofers yes they do and and uh they've most often seen them put both subwoofers in the front wall, or maybe they put them in to the side walls, but not necessarily at the midpoints and not necessarily in, re in rectangular rooms. How do they know if these are the best spots? Is there a way to measure before installing them? The in-wall subs that he has seen from, say, JL Audio are expensive. And now they're a bit concerned. Are you really getting what you paid for with these installations? <laughs> okay. So that, that is a massive question that has everything to do with the installer and their knowledge. And... Uh, very little that we can actually say as a uniform or a, a global sure. truth here. Uh, so <clears throat> if you have a very capable installer, 
who knows what they're doing and has all the proper measurement equipment and software uh, and hel helps you purchase or encourages you to purchase the right equipment, you know, including like needing DSPs and all sorts of other things that you might need. Could they just slap subwoofers into any, any old wall that they wanted and get a fairly good performance? Well, the answer is probably. Mm. Uh, it would depend like your room size and, and I... In my, in most cases, in, you know, custom installers are dealing with people who have very little knowledge about home theater, mm -hmm. but want one. Sure, they they they're sure they want one, but they're absolutely sure they don't want it to look like one. Yeah, they don't want to see that, anything. They don't want to see it, and so sometimes they dictate where stuff goes. They're like, right. everything's got to go in here. What's the custom installer supposed to say? I'm not, right. I refuse to do that, or I do the best I can. And if you have 30 customers in a row who tell you that, the first thing out of your mouth when you meet customer 31, <laughs> who instead actually wants a home theater that sounds and that sounds good and looks like a home theater and mm. doesn't mind seeing some speakers, is I've got great in-wall subwoofer suggestions for you. <laughs> does that mean they necessarily think they sound the best? No. But it does mean that that, that is what has been successful for them in the sure. past. You can think of this like a, like a Skinnerian or P Pavlovian response. <laughs> they've gotten good feedback from customers because they've done things, right. so they keep wanting to do those things. Uh, In-wall subwoofers are you know, very finicky as to where or how you can install them. It's, it's, if you're not like going to reconfigure a wall, which most custom installers mm -hmm. are not going to do uh, because of cost and, and time and mess and everything else, uh, you don't have infinite placements. You may think, oh, I can put it in any wall I want. <laughs> you, do, you cannot. Mm -hmm. There are wires back there. There's plumbing back there. There's all sorts of you know fire bracing and other things that mm -hmm. may dictate where you can put those subwoofers. So when you say, oh, they put them all on the front wall, that literally may be the only place they could have put those in-wall subwoofers sure. that they're their customers or demanding. it is very common to see installations where people are like these subwoofers are meant to augment the bass coming from my front speakers so they go in the front i mean there's there, the front. there are That's plenty right. of installers who still just <laughs> there are plenty of installers who still subscribe to the idea of subwoofers are somehow a compromise or a bad thing they they are still out there and there's the ones who if they do install subwoofers they're like yeah they just they just go in the front that's that's where yeah. they go and the thing is how many of their customers end up paying base sweeps on repeat and going around to every seat in the room and seeing how even the base sweep sounds or measuring <laughs> like none of their customers are doing that they just right. know that when the explosion goes off they hear a boom and they're happy so yeah. things rattle yeah yeah, uh, yeah and if you're the custom installer you're like <laughs> if yeah right if, if you're a custom installer what is your goal is your goal to make every seat in the room perfect mm. or very very even very very good or is your goal to make a great looking home theater right. for somebody who's going to sit in the same seat every single sure. time they're in that room in which case you literally have to make it sound good for that one seat mm -hmm. which is not hard to do even Indeed. with uh even with poorly placed subwoofers yeah. so you know i i always want to say that like the custom installers out there who insist that subwoofers should be placed at the front of the room because they're they're augmenting the main speakers and everything else, I think that that's an unconscionable thing. I think that those people <laughs> should know better. Mm. I think that they should. I do not blame custom ins installers who know better, but do it anyway mm -hmm. because it's what their customers want or what their customers I mean, that expect. even goes for or all the speakers in this system are in the ceiling because if that yes. is what their client is demanding... Or just expecting, yeah. Yeah. you know, they're like, I went to another home theater That's right. and it was all in the ceiling and you couldn't see anything. It was great. You don't even broach the subject of, well, yeah. can we at least try in walls? Yeah. Because in walls will sound a lot better. You don't because the customer has already expressed to you what they, what they think and what mm -hmm. they want. And they're not paying a little bit of money for this. They're paying a lot right. of money for it. So you just do what they want. It doesn't really matter if you know better or not <laughs> because they are the customer. So... Yes, I think that custom installers have an obligation to their craft to know how to properly set up a home theater or a, you know a, a theater room so that it sounds good. I don't think they have an obligation to insist that their customers allow them to do so. Oh yeah, there are enough fights between the clients and the installers as it oh, is yeah. that yeah. this is not the hill that you need to die on. So I mean, 
to just say, if you saw some custom installations <coughs> and there's in-wall subs and there's two in-wall subs and they're both at the front of the room, they're right on either side of the center speaker, and you went, you know, according to the AV Rant guys, that isn't going to be ringing every drop of performance that I can out of these things. And if I sit in the rear left seat of this three-row theater versus the prime seat right in the middle of the front row, I'm not going to have as good a bass experience. Like, all of that is true. But we're not going to say that we really blame the installer because there are plenty of reasons why that might have yeah. been the way to do it. It isn't the end of the world. You can still get like decent bass performance from one sub in the middle of the front wall. You can still get decent bass performance on most seats just doing that. And if you have two subs in the front wall relatively close together, that's basically what you've got is one sub in the middle of the front yeah. wall because they're essentially yeah. co-located. So... We're I mean, not, if they're within like twenty feet of each other, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, so we're not gonna. We're, we we agree you aren't ringing every last drop of possible performance uh, out of your subwoofers when you set them up that way, particularly not for every seat in the theater. Uh, but we also aren't gonna blame the installers for having done it, unless it's the case where the customer they, said. Wouldn't it be better to have four subwoofers in the four corners of this room? And they said, no, we will only install one subwoofer in your front wall one third of the way across the wall. That's the only thing we do. If that's what they did, then we blame them. But if it was something else, then we the other th The other thing I would blame them for is if the customer said, where do you think I should put my right, speakers right, and right, my right. subwoofers? And they said, you should put them here. Be and even if they knew better, they suggested it because it's the easy sell sure. rather than saying you know hey we've done this a lot of times and here's what sounds here's what most people do mm -hmm. here's why it doesn't sound as good as if you do it this way but we can make it sound pretty you know yeah. really good for your seat yeah, or yeah, your yeah. couple of seats for you and your wife and you and your wife and, and kid uh we can sound like make, make it sound pretty good you know really good for you guys but it won't sound as good for everybody else but we'll be able to put them wherever you want. But if you put them optimally, then every seat will sound much better, including yours. Yeah. Uh, I, I, if they didn't have that conversation when they had the opportunity, then I do put some <laughs> blame on their shoulders. Alex. Alex says, which TV around 75 inches? Uh, in screen size, we recommend it for a $1,500 budget. Alex knows a 77-inch OLED would be the best picture quality, but they're still closer to three grand. So what gets the nod for about half that much? <laughs> I don't know, Rob. We'll get so not for half that much. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would around that price range probably point you to Sony's X90J. Uh, right now, it's seventeen hundred dollars, so it's two hundred dollars over fifteen hundred dollars, but it's closer to fifteen hundred than it is to three thousand at seventeen hundred dollars, and sales do happen. So Sony's X90J is like, it's a good. TV. Is it the best TV ever? Nope. Is it the very best black levels ever? Nope. But it's accurate in color. It's accurate in the contrast that it shows you. The interface works well. It's dependable. And like across the board, it's a solid TV. And it has all the latest features. It's got, it's got VRR now. The update came. Woohoo! It's got VRR, supports 4K 120. It has two HDMI 2.1 inputs, uh, does Dolby Vision, you know. So it's got all the features and it's very solid. But it's $200 above your budget. So if it has to be under $1,500, I would probably point you to a TCL. Now, I kind of want to shy away from the R646 a little bit. That's $1,300 at the 75-inch size. Picture quality-wise, it's good. It's bright. It's got full array local dimming with plenty of zones. It has accurate color. All of those things are fine. It's the interface that's buggy as all get out. So if you don't use any of the built-in apps... And if you don't have to switch inputs a bunch, because apparently it's got a bug where sometimes you switch inputs and it loses its picture settings, <laughs> which is really bad. But if you do all of your HDMI switching through an AV receiver and you do all of your streaming services through an external player, then as a monitor <laughs> on a single input, the TCL R646 is a very solid picture quality performer. But using it apparently is still a bit of a nightmare because people are still saying, yeah, there's lots of bugs with this thing. So mm. there is still the TCL R635. That's going back a couple of years, but it's also $1,300. It has the Roku interface, which at this point is very stable from TCL. And picture quality wise, it's about the same. The only thing is the R635 being a couple of years older, it does not do 4K 120. 
It does 4K mm. 60. It does VRR. It does variable refresh rate. It does 1080p 120. It even does 1440p 120, but it does not do 4K 120. So if you mm. got to have 4K 120, the 646 does do that. Uh, the very cheapest, I might suggest, is Hisense's U7G. Again, solid picture performance, all the features. It does 4K 120, it does VRR, but that Android TV interface is a bit bleh, a bit questionable there. But it's $1,100 for 75 inches, so it's pretty solid on that front. Mike asks, is there any reason you should pay more for the Denon X2700H over the 1700H? 27 versus 17. Mm -hmm. He wants to power a 5.1 setup where all the speakers are in the ceiling, so he isn't particularly worried about the level of Odyssey or the utmost sound quality. He doesn't really need any HDMI 2.1 inputs. He does, however, want an IR input since the AV receiver is 25 feet away without a clear line of sight, but both the X1700H and the 2700H have an IR jack in the back. Mm -hmm. So the 2700H has a bit more power on its spec sheet and dual HDMI outputs that he doesn't need. Is that about it? He just wants to make sure he's not overlooking something before pulling the trigger on the 1700H. I cannot possibly think of a feature that you would want for a 5.1 setup Yeah, that this might have, that one might have over the other. Uh, there's literally nothing I can think of. <laughs> uh, nothing. You're not, you're not you're looking for zone two. You don't need HMI 2.1. You don't need pre out. I mean, even if he does you don't want need zone, Odyssey. Even if he does want zone two, they both have a zone two pre out and they can both reassign their surround back speakers to be zone two. So even on zone two, they're a wash. <laughs> I mean, it's just, they're, this is one of those cases where you're like, just buy the cheapest. <laughs> well, I mean, fair enough to double check before he does it. Absolutely, this is, this is still Absolutely. a sizable purchase. He's like, is there is there something I'm actually, missing? Uh, but this it, is actually good for me because I just wrote a AVR, uh, an a, a AV receiver, like you know, upgrade checklist mm -hmm. yesterday. I was just like thinking about it. I'm like, what are the things that you really need to think about before you buy uh, a Navy receiver? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there who are like, I'm going to upgrade to Odyssey someday, so I should buy a new receiver, right? Like. I know HDMI 2.1 came out. I should buy a new receiver, right? Like, <laughs> should you though? You know, because do you game, bro? I mean, the 1700 yeah. is really future proof as far as that goes. It's got three HDMI 2.1 inputs, and the 2700H only has a single HDMI 2.1 yeah. input, none of which he needs. But yes. on that front, the 1700 is actually more future proof. Uh, there is one feature that the 2700H has that the 1700H lacks that might be very important to you, which is the 1700H will not convert analog video signals to HDMI. Ah. If you still have a Nintendo Wii, and plenty of people do, sometimes they're like, wait a second, I can't plug my Wii into my AV receiver and then run a single HDMI cord anymore. So What's the difference in price, though? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, uh, substantial, several hundred dollars anyway. <laughs> I mean, a convert an HDMI external box that does that. Sure, sure, probably, sure. But I'm just probably going to be less than I'm that. I'm just like sometimes that's the feature that people were yeah. like, oh man, I really actually needed that analog video conversion. Also, the 1700H has done away with a component video input entirely. It doesn't bother having one. The 27H, uh, 2700H has one component video input. <laughs> that will get converted to HDMI if you need it to. So that maybe that's the feature. But honestly, it's it's the video side of things. It's the analog video to HDMI conversion and having two HDMI outputs uh, that the 2700H offers you. Sometimes that's exactly what you need. So it's nice that it yeah. exists. But I think in your situation, the 1700H is all you need, Mike. All right, Andrew. Andrew wants some earphones slash earbuds, mostly for Zoom meetings and some music. His budget is 100 bucks Canadian. He doesn't matter if they're wired or Bluetooth. He doesn't want to sacrifice sound quality, and he prefers a natural, a neutral, sorry, flat response. One concern is comfort. He isn't hasn't been happy with the standard rubbery tips that come with most earbuds. He was hoping for foam tips. You don't like the rubber tips, man. The foam tips aren't any better, I'm going to be honest with you. So what do we suggest? Um... Rob's got some suggestions here. I'm going to see if I published that review yet. Okay. Uh, there was really only uh, one brand that came to mind for me, which is Shure. That's uh, S-H-U-R-E is how that's spelled, but Shure. Uh, I would immediately point you to the 215s, the Shure SE215s. Those are actually uh, the very same earphones that I am wearing right now as I record this podcast. So they are... Uh, the design where the cable comes up and over the back of your ear, and then it sits very 
nicely and comfortably and flush in the pin of ear. You can actually lie down on your ear with these in and it does not hurt. Um, it fits very nicely in there, forms a good seal if you wear them properly and uh, and sounds really, really great. So I really like uh, the Shure SE215s. They're one of my favorite things to recommend. They are, however, $120 Canadian uh, on Amazon.ca. There are some different colors. So there, uh, some of the colors cost $130, uh, but $120 is, uh, is the least that you can spend to get uh, a brand new pair of Shure SE215s. Um, so if that's just a no-go, just because of the price, because we exceeded the $100 budget, uh, there is the step down, which is the uh, 112s, the Shure SE112s. The design on these, just the physical design on them is a little bit different. Um, so they're still meant to have the uh, wire come up over the back of your ear and go in, but the those uh, the 112s do not sit flush in the ear. Uh, they're a bit bulbous and they uh, they stick out of the ear a little bit, so you wouldn't want to like lie down on your ear with them in. They're a little bit rounder and a little bit fatter. But both the 112 and the 215s come with a whole fit kit. They have both silicone tips and uh, compressible foam tips uh, in three different sizes for each. And one little tip I always like to say to people is, do not assume that your left ear and the right ear use the same size of tip. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. that's the thing that causes the discomfort because people are like, well, I, I use a medium tip. And it turns out you use a medium tip in your left ear and you use a small tip in your right ear or a large tip in your right ear, whatever it is. They might be mismatched and that's fine. There's no reason you can't have different size ear tips for your two different ears so that they fit properly. And sometimes people find us silicone tip in one ear uh, feels better while a foam tip feels better in their right ear like you're allowed to do that but you have the options with either the 215 or the 112 so uh, if Tom has other suggestions but those one uh, by the way the 112s are $75 on amazon.ca so that is definitely fitting your budget if you need to uh, get under 100 so I mean the ones that I'm going to suggest uh, I actually just reviewed a pair of headphones from um Soundcore, which I think way outside your budget, ah. <laughs> uh, that would that would go pretty well for you as far as comfort wise. Now they don't have the foam tips, but I'm with Rob on this. Uh, the foam tips for me, you know, if you've ever worn foam earplugs, you mm -hmm. know, the ones that are you know, meant to protect your hearing when you're in you know environments and loud environments, you know, they get in there and they're fine at first, but they are not to me any more comfortable than the rubber ones. They definitely can be uh, very irritating after a, a period of time. And, I use um, the uh, silicone tip and I, I like can wear that all day long and I find the silicone tip on the shores very comfortable. So the the TCL uh, Move Audio S600 in-ear uh, earbuds are uh, the ones I would suggest. Mm -hmm. They do have your normal rubber tips. They mm -hmm. don't have the silicone, they don't have the foam ones, but they are a, a bulbous design that sort of mm -hmm. It, it it's it sits in your ear mm -hmm. and the tip doesn't it's not held in by the tip as much as it is just by the the shape of the the earphone itself the earbud itself so i like these i find these extremely comfortable mm. they sound really good uh they're 99 dollars american so i don't know what that makes them canadian probably a thousand or something i don't know <laughs> well, it'll be but, over a uh, hundred yeah if yeah, they're, they're so, hundred dollars uh, american they'll be over a hundred canadian <laughs> So you're gonna have to look look for those on sale someplace, but mm. or maybe Rob can look it up and see what they are. But uh, in Canada, but uh, those are the ones I would recommend. I okay. got those, you know, for review, and then I ended up buying another pair for my one of my sons for Christmas mm -hmm. because he wanted some earbuds, and he wears them non, literally nonstop. Mm. So they. You know, uh, and I've seen him sleep in them, so I know that okay. <laughs> I know that I know that they're at least comfortable enough for him to sleep. But but for me, you know, it's almost like the ear, the silicone ear tip, is just there to to stop sound leakage. It's mm -hmm. not there to hold your the earbud in place. Okay. Uh, so it tends to for me to be a lot more comfortable. And even doing, especially for Zoom calls, you're not going to have any mm. problem with them whatsoever. So I very much like those. And they might be worth a little bit of, of the extra money. The there as TCL well. they, they, Move Audio S600 are $127 yeah. on Amazon.ca. So uh, right in line with the uh, Shure SE215s. Um, 
just to go back to those, the 215s and the 112s, they are both wired. There is a wireless version of them, but it's just um, the cables are actually replaceable on uh, the Shure earphones. Uh, they have a, uh, right. a, a detachable clip. So it's um, it's a little cord with the Bluetooth adapter on it that is like an add-on for those. So that uh, increases the price. But you can make them wireless. You can make them Bluetooth, but they're not true wireless. The Shure yeah, the, earphones. The TCLs are, are true wireless. The t- TCLs are true wireless, like uh, uh, think of AirPods, right? They look exactly like yeah. Apple AirPods. Uh, the Shures won't. If you make them wireless, they still have a cord. It's just that the, the cord goes between the two earphones and then hangs by your neck. Uh, why the 215s, I think, are worth the $120 over the $75 of the 112s. The 112s have much less bass. Uh, the bass is extended on the 215s. They are a really full range earphone, and that's what you're paying for. So if you if you want your music to sound fuller and uh, truly full range, then that's what the 215s would be worth paying the extra money for. But yeah, if you want uh, Bluetooth, then those TCL Move Audio S 600s they are over a hundred dollars Canadian, but not egregiously so. And uh, right. yeah, that could be an option. Great. So we have left. We have John and Infinite Gary. That is it right. on the list. John's question is pretty long, but uh, that's all uh, right. That's why, that's why I skipped it. Well, yes, and that's actually <laughs> why I ordered it this way, because I'm like, I think we can get through 10 if we do the shorter questions this week. <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, thank well thank our listeners of the week and, and congratulate our winner of our of our contest giveaway yeah. from James House of Cards. He won a, so Robert W. won a... Uh, SBL meter as well as a U- calibrated U mic one. So yes, congratulations. congratulations, Robert. And uh, yeah, we'll be getting in touch with you via email. In fact, by the time you hear this podcast, that might have already taken place. And so yeah, we'll we'll yeah. see how that all worked out. Because if he says no, I don't want them, then we're gonna go to one of those other numbers that we for some reason drew live on the podcast for reasons that that because I'm not be doing out. it again, Rob. Yeah, I I you we know have, you forget we, about it after. I'm gonna forget, and then maybe I have to download the thing again, and they're no longer in the same order. And now it's I, it. it's gone. All right. So now it's done, and it's it's all done at the same time. Done Whatever random number seed your random number generated mm-hmm. generated all happened at the same time. So okay. I don't want there to be any sort of bias, implicit <laughs> or implied. It's very worried about such things. Okay. All right. We we'll thank our listeners of the week. We mm-hmm. want to thank well, first James House of Cards for yes. setting us up with this, thank this you, contest. James. Very much, very much. Uh, we want to thank Nick for going to avrant.com, clicking the buy us a cup of coffee link, and sending us a PayPal donation, as well as our 145 patrons over at patreon.com. Yes, indeed. Thank you to all of you. Nick, thank you so much for the PayPal donation, and patreon.com slash podcast <clears throat> is the place to go to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. So a big thank you to our 145 patrons over there. I want to thank Ash for creating our new artwork for our 800th yeah, episode. It's our thank 800th you, Ash. episode. 800 Woo-hoo. episodes of AV Ramp Podcast. So thank oh, you very is... much, Ash. I really, really appreciate putting in the work there because he charged us no money. So he's doing I that know. gratis. And that's very nice of him because he's a busy man with more important things to do than that is true. do this for us. But he's a fan. So that's his way of contributing, which is really, really nice of him. I want to thank those who sent us notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going, including Mark, Gorinder, Jeremy, Ash, Andrew, and Nathan. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll say the names one more time. Mark, Gorinder, Jeremy, Ash, Andrew, and Nathan. Thank you so much for the notes of gratitude and encouragement. They are very much appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who listens to the podcast and sends in questions 800 times. Well, not the questions so much, because it wasn't a question and answer at the very beginning of the uh, podcast. But uh, you know. Very beginning. It was like more than half of it. <laughs> it's it's been yes the lion's share has been questioned and answered so wonderful to do that i'm quite proud of us having reached 800 episodes so thank you very much thank you to tom because i mean none of this uh, i wasn't around at the beginning of this it was tom who started this and so there you go we wouldn't be here without him here's the 800 more yeah except i, I don't know how that's going to work with the number i i put three digits in our numbering system of our <laughs> podcast because i thought we'll never get past a thousand <laughs> And I, w- I really want to get to 1,000. That's my goal, is to get to 1,000. All right. For AV Rants, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.